Good morning, everyone. We will go ahead and get started. Um, it's great to see everyone. Rebe Hazard will be joining us remotely for uh, this meeting. And, uh, Yep, but uh, we will look for her. We will start with roll call. So Stephanie, would you do the roll? Alvin Mandenbrink. Doug Monger. Here. John Ely. Here. Kathleen Curry. Here. Kathy Chandler Henry. Here. Mark Catlin. <coughs> Mark Rover. Here. Martha Whitmore. Present. Mike Richard. Here. Rebe Hazard. Scott McGinnis, Here. Stan Winnery, Steve Beckley, Here. Taylor Haas, Here. Tom Gray. Here. We do have a quorum. If I can just let you know, Alden Vandenbrink, Commissioner Director Vandenbrink, uh, informed me that he was stuck in construction traffic uh, on the way here, but should be here by 10 o'clock. A stopping place there. <laughs> and, yes, and Director Catlin um, sends his uh, regrets, but he is the first time in his life over in England explaining Colorado agriculture to the uh, Brits. So, oh my um, gosh, yes. <laughs> that could take a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. um, we will review the meeting agenda and one addition. And you want to explain? Sure. Um, sure, I can take a whack at it. Um, uh, we um, would uh, recommend that the board um, accept an amendment or revision to its agenda on uh -huh. item eight on the um, community funding project to address a proposed amendment to a previously awarded grant for the city of Steamboat Springs uh, irrigation efficiency project. Yeah, you should have got a late memo um, on that due to the late developing um, issue. And if anybody doesn't have the email or can't pull it up, uh, Stephanie does have a few paper copies for that CFP memo. Will that be discussed today? It will, or... it will be discussed later today after lunch. Okay. Any other changes to the agenda? Uh, motion to approve. Move to approve as amended. Second. Okay. Okay, moved by Whitmore, second by Curry. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, first up is consent agenda, and we have three items on consent. Minutes from the third quarterly meeting in July, minutes from an executive committee meeting in September, and minutes of special joint meeting and budget workshop on September 21st. Any uh, corrections to those minutes? Take a motion. Move to approve. Okay, move by Whitmore, uh, second by Haas. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda is approved. We are, uh, we're ahead of time. Well, we're we're ahead of time. We'll see how quickly <laughs> we can cure that problem. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> Uh, Madam President, I would make a recommendation that if the board convene into executive session to um, discuss the items on your agenda tab 3A, which is the CRS section 24 6 402 4 e and E. a motion? Margaret Rose, second. Okay, and second by Richard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, we are in executive session. Just before you had uh, if, uh, killed the recording, I would state for the record that the subject matter um, discussed in executive session today will constitute attorney client communications for no uh, uh, for which no further recording needs to be made. I'm gonna... <clears throat> Looking for a thumbs up. Uh, Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Madam Chair. During the executive session portion of the River District's board meeting today, the board discussed with council um, the items listed on agenda 3A. Um, I believe there is one action item that um, staff was uh, considering for, that the board undertake uh, coming up of uh, 
executive session, I'd ask Jason to tee that up as well as a um, discussion on a um, matter in, contained in your public board memo. Yes, and this uh, has to do with the River District's conditional water rights. We recommend that the board confirm its attempt to maintain the remaining conditional components of the exchange rates adjudicated in case number 05 CW 265 in Water Division 5 and direct staff to take the steps necessary to complete the appropriation in a reasonable, expedient, and efficient manner consistent with Colorado law. We further recommend that the board direct council and staff to file an application seeking to make absolute the Green Mountain Reservoir to Wolford Mountain Reservoir exchange component at the rate of 36.44 CFS and seek a finding of reasonable dilig diligence for the remaining conditional components of the exchange rate decreed in case number 05 CW 265 in Water Division 5. I move staff recommendation. Okay, moved by Whitmore, second by Haas. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion approved. And the last matter deals with a request for a license agreement. Um, the River District owns 105 acres of property on Homestead Creek. It was purchased back in the 70s. We have um, provided a license agreement to some folks that own property adjacent to them. That, uh, <coughs> that parcel, um, the Gastons, they have requested a renewal of that license for an additional five years. We, uh, the Gastons are allowed to have no more than 10 head of livestock up there. My understanding is they currently have some horses that they have up there. They also irrigate the property with um, two CFS of the Bottleson Ditch water right. Um, as far as I understand from our technical staff, they've been good licensees and it's important for us to keep eyes on that property in the past when we haven't had an agreement with folks. We've found trash up there. I think we had a camper that was parked up there at one point. Um, they are charged um, $105 a year for that license, which is rather minimal, but um, they do keep an eye on the property. So we would request that the board authorize the general manager to execute a five-year license agreement with Diane and Brian Gaston for use of the River District's Homestead Creek property consistent with the terms of the previous license agreement. And there was a copy of that previous license agreement that was, and also the uh, Gaston's request that was included with the board packet. Questions for Jason? Of course. Uh, Jeff, let me get us. Previous agreement was 20 years? Five. Five. Thank you. I would move staff recommendation, Monger. All right, moved by Monger. Second. Second by Whitmore. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion's approved. Thank you. I don't have anything further. Um, Madam Journalist, the board has questions about anything else in the uh, general counsel public report. Okay. All right, so we will take a break from lunch. It is about one o'clock. Um, we want to try and be back by 1 30. Sure. Let's try. It, um, you're welcome to do that. I would just say this is one of those rare meetings where you actually have some time where we can kick items over to tomorrow. Um, so it's the board's pleasure, but if you want 45 minutes for lunch, we'll close the half an hour. You, <laughs> you could actually take that. I'm just meeting. getting hungry. You know, I want to just suggest that it's not a bad idea. All right, so we'll go till 1.45 at our uh, general manager's suggestion. Public. Our first item on the agenda is public comment. Uh, is there anyone here who would like to address the board on any items not on the agenda? Is anyone, and I do not think we have anyone online. Uh, so we will close public comment and move to general manager. Well, thank you, Madam President. Um, I'll try to be brief on some of these. Um, the Colorado River Dra Drought Task Force um, has, uh, is just about halfway through with, with uh, six of 12 originally scheduled meetings. Um, I think I said in my memo that you know we hadn't necessarily made a whole lot of progress, and I would say that that's still the case. Um, I think that there's been a lot of discussion um, recently in the last few meetings both about, uh, there was first a, a decision by the task force to bifurcate the discussion, one face uh, dealing with suggestions inside the state for tools that could be used to help mitigate drought 
uh, inside the state and, and um, both modifications to existing programs, but, but also looking at newer programs. Um, and then the conversation just last week started to turn to interstate issues, which I think is a major focus of what the legislature was looking for when they passed the bill. Um, you know, in the interstate, I can take that first. I, you know, there's a lot of discussion about how we how we manage water during times of drought to, to meet um, various needs. Um, I, I think one of the perspectives I've brought to that discussion, hopefully consistent with this board, is the use of storage water um, should be the primary focus and and and. Um, the question is, how do you do it in a way that is um, consistent with the prior appropriation doctrine, but also allows flexibility for things along the lines of what this district has done uh, up on Elkhead um, and uh, in it with uh, Rudai and, and uh, even Wolford to a lesser extent? How do we how do we find creative solutions? to help fish population, recreation, and, and the environment while meeting the needs of our consumptive users on, on the street. And, and um, you know, you'll recall we, we had some, um, wasn't smooth sailing the first time we tried to do that up in the AMPA. The state wasn't sure that our water rights would uh, allow us to do what we did. Um, we had to go get an opinion from a fish uh, specialist that said water and river is good for fish, and therefore it was consistent with our with our rights. And um, and because we had water that, thanks to our council and that uh, decree that said that we could enhance uh, the fish flows, so we did. Um, we also happened to get water to our consumptive users downstream, who were otherwise going to be called out. And, and um, so it's those kind of creative solutions that are are needed more. Um, there have been a lot of other ideas thrown out there, uh, but not necessarily any, there's been no vote yet, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but but we haven't voted on any of those recommendations. I think we, we have a list of intrastate ideas, and now we're turning the interstate, we're gonna get two lists of, 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 of concepts um, and then bring them forward to uh, a vote, I think, it, uh, and then put it into a report um, from the commission. I, I would say one of the um, frequently expressed perspectives on, from members of the task force is that you know, 12 meetings, now 13 in less than six months is not enough time to, to really solve much related to a very complex problem. Um, so that being said, the legislature still asked for a report. So I think we'll get them a report. Um, I would I would say um, on the intrastate interstate issues I want to just touch on that. Um, there have been discussions right about programs that have different names right demand management, system conservation, um, a strategic water reserve or water banking really are the four main discussion items among that group. And from my very simplistic perspective they all share some really common elements that, that we all ought to think about. And I think this district has spent a lot of time, this board has spent a lot of time thinking about it. And that is all of them are aimed at reducing current consumptive use and having it available for a different purpose. And um, whether it's water banking or whether it's a strategic water reserve or whether it's system conservation or or demand management. And, and if that's the case, if they're all similar in fashion to demand management, you know, our state has a demand management policy statement that the CWCD board passed in 2018. It talks about avoiding disproportionate harm to any one area or region of the state. It talks about um, uh, a number of factors that this board has, has <coughs> as well. And I, I, I think um, that's really critical um, in moving forward. So, you know, my hope is whatever the program is named or whatever is, is looked at is, is consistent with guiding principles. The CWCB demand management policy statement is exactly that. It's a policy passed by a board, not by the legislature. It's not law. 
So should there be elements of that policy statement that are codified by the legislature to protect uh, local communities and industries like agriculture? And um, if you look at our guiding principles that you've suggested, um, that not suggested, you've asked us, Peter and I, to follow. <laughs> um, you know, the first one we spent a lot of time this past meeting talking about, which is what are the triggers before we do any of these water conservation programs? And so I said, let's let's talk about that. Let's get that out on the table. And and I said, you know, I said the lower basin needs to bring its consumptive use within its compact allotment on a permanent and enforceable basis. And that includes system loss accounting issues. Um, and then there should be some hydrologic trigger associated with that because if the reservoirs are full or almost full, why would we be doing that, that, that um, in conservation for interstate purposes? It, you know, what trigger is there? Um, I, there was not consensus on that position at all. Really? Yeah, yeah. There um, was a request by folks from the state's perspective, or maybe he's talking on behalf of the state's perspective, that they didn't really want to see those triggers codified and in, 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 even in a resolution mm -hmm. um, because it, they felt it would create too uh, much um, rigidity for our negotiating team. Um, at the uh, interstate level. Um, it doesn't mean that that idea is dead. I just, there wasn't unanimous or, or, or opinion or agreement about that. And it, and it was interesting um, to see that to me. Um, and I think there is, you know, unanimous agreement that the lower basin needs to reduce its overuse, right? But if you, if you then set a hard, hard line on that, there was concerns that were expressed by some. Um, so that that was interesting. I, I did uh, bring up the concept of the fact that these are all very similar programs and could have similar negative effects on local or rural economies in the Western Colorado and said, you know, push the idea that, that as the statute said, we have to recommend the ways in which those programs, the respective roles in those programs for the, the CWCB and the water conservation districts. And I said, so we have models of those in, in our state. We have what happened in the Republican and the Rio Grande where the state with federal money has funded uh, permanent retirement of, of ag. No one in, in that room or elsewhere that I've heard are arguing for permanent retirement of ag, but, but how do you do that in, in the Colorado River? And our suggestion um, was that it should be run by the, the conservation districts on the West Slope in coordination with the state as part of the state program, but that it should be run by the conservation districts. And then we should be adapting those programs for our local regional areas that are all different and have different types of systems and different types of crops and different types of uh, soil systems and even different water rights when you look at our federal projects compared to our, our, our private ditches. And um, I don't think we are done talking about that. We didn't get much conversation on that point, I would say. Um, I didn't, no one screamed and yelled, but it wasn't like, oh yeah, yeah, exactly what you said. You know, no one said that. So, you know, um, I don't know, Kathy, am I? Um, uh, the only other thing I would add is um, there seems to be a, a big consensus around the idea of more funding for aging infrastructure. Yeah. So from all different sectors, from ag, municipalities, trans mountain diverters. And so that, I mean, that seems like sort of a simple thing, but I think that could be a powerful recommendation coming from the task force is to make the uh, the grant programs at the state more available for aging infrastructure and also just to have more money in that pot for aging infrastructure. Um, so I think that would be helpful. The task force keeps coming back to this idea of do no harm, so sort of using that as a gauge for anything that comes up is their potential for unintended consequence as there often is. And then the other one you, you mentioned was that lower basin overuse. So I would expect some sort of a strong statement to come out, maybe probably not a legislative recommendation, but a maybe preface to the report that has to do with lower basin overuse uh, that 
before, especially any heavy slate items are tackled. Yeah. And along the lines of, and, um, and I think, well, on the aging infrastructure, one of the ideas is that a lot of funding th um, through both um, Proposition mm -hmm. DD, the, the sport gaming tax, as well as appropriations from our legislature over the last several years, have dumped money into the water plan grant program. The water plan grant program, as currently interpreted by the executive branch, does not fund aging infrastructure. So, how do we create a bucket within the water plan to do that? And that's because the water supply reserve funds are so cyclical and, and variable. Is there a better way to, to create a, a more solid funding for, for infrastructure? And, and I'm hoping that, that there does seem to be more of a consensus around that. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I will just say I, I did, as long as I um, was going to travel down to Ignacio on behalf of the district, I did go down early enough to go on a tour of the um, Pine Ridge Irrigation System um, owned and operated, well, designed and implemented originally by the Bureau of Indian Affairs for the Southern Ute Tribe. And uh, uh, Vice Chair Cloud, uh, or like Cloud has talked to me in the past about how poorly maintained that is and how in need of, 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 of improvement. I mean, talk about aging infrastructure. That stuff was, is ancient and inefficient. And there's, and, and, you know, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has been chronically underfunded and understaffed, even worse than what we deal with in terms of the NRCS and the, the Bureau. Um, and, and so touring that with their um, uh, irrigation folks really made an impression on me. Um, I think it's something that in the future you may hear me bring back to this, this board to weigh in on and support their request for, for better funding for their projects. Um, they, they have blowouts that the, um, the tribe is putting tens of millions of dollars of their own money into infrastructure that is not owned by them, but owned by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, just so that they can get water to their farms. And, um, you know, just very impressive ingenuity by the tribe, but they, they are hamstrung because it's not their project. So, and there's dual canals, privately owned, and then this Pine River system that cross under each other and have blowouts into each other. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. yeah, and that, that goes back to the before the 1930s when they, the tribe and the tribal folks and the, uh, I would say probably the, the uh, European settlers were, were not on good terms. And so they wouldn't cooperate with each other on their irrigation systems. Uh, and, you know, it's it's a it's a mess. I, I have to say that the tribal lands down there, they're a checkerboard pattern of uh, ownership, and so there's all sorts of problems with cross with the tribe getting its its domestic and irrigation water lines and canals across um, non-tribal lands, and it's really hard to take and hard to see, uh, honestly. So, um, yeah, I you know we continue. I continue to. Uh, uh, are you I, I or or make points on behalf of the district? Peter was in at one of the meetings. I wasn't able to attend. Uh, I don't know, Peter, if you have anything else. Uh, nothing um, too substantive. The one I was at was uh, uh, primarily focused on the in, in intrastate issues within Colorado, um, and um, you know, a point I made that Andy uh, already kind of touched upon is that um, all of the, the means that we talk about in Colorado of increasing flexibility and things on the use of, of, of water and of existing water rights are all, you know, it, it, there's, there's good reason to do so, or we wouldn't be talking about it, right? There's, um, you know, you, you want to increase the flexibility to do X, Y, or Z benefits that you find difficult under the existing um, status of the law or administration. And the problem is, is that whatever those things are, um, to a large extent, they inevitably run up against the prior appropriation system. You know, which in here in Colorado, we're you know strict prior appropriation, and um, and at some point in time, you know, you think, well, uh, you know, if this water isn't needed for its decreed purpose, then 
doesn't it go to the next user in line in the priority system? And um, you know, we've had those discussions, for example, previously, and you know, when we talk about uh, legislation that would increase the frequency of the in-stream flow loan statute, things like that, this board has had those discussions. So I merely pointed that out um, uh, during that, that session. Um, the other thing I said was that um, <clears throat> that um, uh, do no harm, which is uh, 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 President Chandler Henry said has been a common theme, um, shouldn't necessarily mean do nothing. So uh, there is a proposal out there from industrial users yeah. who've been working together, um, and that proposal basically is for them to be able to hold on to their water rights as they transition from fossil fuels to whatever their source may be in the renewable energy realm. So the argument is that they're not sure what that's gonna look like. Uh, they don't wanna put their water rights at risk while they're going undergoing a uh, transition. Seem to get a pretty favorable uh, response from the task force. So, so I watched all that and been watching all you guys. You're doing a great job, by the way. So it's like why, watching paint dry. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea of what Jackie had said about, and, and again, I think uh, the lady from uh, Montrose brought it up too. I think we are, I hope we're talking about absolute rights and not conditional water rights. Because if you're not using them now, and they're not absolute right now. I don't know how you could tie them up anymore and we go into a worse system to create the energy that, than what we are now with the uh, coal-fired power plants. So I hope that was, I, I'm just bringing that up. That's I had understood the proposal to apply to both. I could be wrong. And I understand there will be a, at least a one pager, if not more uh, white paper on the proposal. Um, I talked to uh, Excel's water, folks about it and they said they they were coming up with something that they get to us shortly and I haven't seen it yet but I I, I have concerns um, up in the Yampa as to we preserve these energy water rights for you know through I think the proposal is 2050 if, if, if they're not being used and they would have otherwise been used by the next in line seniors, who were next line juniors who are ag rights are, are is that I, I I think we really need to hear from the local uh, community in the Yampa before weighing in on that position on that on that, on that suggestion one way or the other. And I'm hopeful that we'll get some get that proposal fleshed out a little bit and maybe even be able to bring it up to the <coughs> Yampa roundtable for a discussion about it. Uh, would be my hope. But I don't know if if either. Our Yampa directors have any thoughts about it at this point? But well, I agree with what you said. I mean, uh, you know, and again, I I hope it isn't so. Yeah, you can use them, but you need to buy them from us or whatever. So I don't know. I, and I think you're right. The prior appropriation next to mine, if you're not using them, especially if they're direct flow rights. I guess if they're storage rights, you know, that might be a little different thing. And storage rights. You know they paid for the storage, but if it's their direct flow rights, that they should just release them then, and, and then for the year or whatever, release them, not use them, and they become available to the next water user down the road, down the stream. Yeah, my yeah, my personal opinion is we shouldn't carve out an exception because they happen to be a utility company. When Doug and I and everyone else has to live under that abandonment rule, and. If we can't use our water rights, then we'll be available not only to the seniors or the other juniors below, but to new new water rights that might on file. They have the beneficial use. So I I would hate to see us carve out some special exception. They, they'll have 10 years from the time they finally quit diverting for power generation to come up with beneficial use and not speculation. Speculative. That's probably enough. Yeah, I, I guess I'm going to, Tom, I don't contradict you very often, but this is one to where 
legislatively, they've been forced to give up their ability to put those water rights to beneficial use, at least some of the beneficial uses that are attached to it. And I'm seeing that even with, with, with these other industries <coughs> where the state is now looking upon them to, for them to, um, oh, you up your water rights on. Diligence. You do your diligence. Thank you very much. But now you can't do your diligence because putting that water right to beneficial use that you've had now for 75 years is now considered speculative because Colorado water law has changed or Colorado laws have changed within the past three years. So I, 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 I kind of see to where I, there should be an opportunity for them to change some of their abilities to use that water, because it may not be just for energy use. Now it might be for manufacturing of some sort. These products have more than one beneficial use. It, it's not like wind, where that wind turbine just creates wind energy. You know, coal can create other products. So can oil and natural gas. They can create other products as well, you know. Um, and I think they should have the opportunity and given some latitude to move forward and prove up their ability to put that water to beneficial use rather than being hamstrung because Colorado legislature decided to change the law. Well, I'm not quite full on that, but okay. <laughs> well, I'm happy to, as soon as we, we, we get some more information about it, bring it back yeah. and send it out to the board. I just... I wanted to give you a heads up on that, and I, I, I think it's a, it's an interesting proposal, and it, it could, I could see a way it might work. I could see ways that it, Tom, that I would agree with you. So I just, I'm not sure, as I said, like I'm not sure what it exactly entails at this point. So, um, I think anything else on the drought task force? Yeah. So, yeah. so I guess I don't want to lose sight of, this uh, is a public meeting, so I don't want to lose sight of the fact that last winter. In a legislative session, there were proposals floated. There were new bills filed, but there were proposals, very definite proposals. We had copies of proposals. And the reason this task force came in agreement is because the key legislators said, we're not sure that, that you've hammered this out enough. We're hearing lots of things. We're going to get some really good water people together and have them make recommendations to us. And, and I think I keep hearing. And I, and I heard just recently that there's there's there are those saying who are saying do nothing. You know we, we don't want you to muddy the water for our, our uh, renegotiations of the guidelines. And, and yet that's the reason that the legislature appointed the task force was to not come up with with specific uh, guidance on exactly how. Uh, how drought security would be, but, but maybe the guidelines so that when we have three dry years in a row, again, we're not back at scratch having the legislature having to field all these proposals because this task force does come up with some recommendations of, okay, what are the triggers when we would need to do some, I'll use demand management, but when are the triggers and if so, who's going to be involved and how is that going to be structured so that there's a place to start? I, I in my conversations with some legislators and with some of you all, I think that was their intent of the legislature for the task force was to do something and give us some guidance. So I hope that that's what happens and that the, the ones of the opinion we shouldn't do anything because of the harm or we should do no longer uh, don't win that don't win that, that conversation because I think they would not be following through with what the intent of this legislation that formed the task force was. So that's my opinion. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. And just to build off of what Dr. Gray said, um, there is a, a coalition of ag groups that's been meeting after each task force meeting just by Zoom. And um, it's been, we've had some great discussions and offered some input uh, to the, the various folks on the task force, you know, individually because of the um, public communications requirements. And uh, really this issue, uh, we that group has talked about what Tom raised, but one of the things that came out of the discussions that I've heard are that the 
ag producers were hoping that this is an opportunity to do something to try to reduce impacts in the future if there ever is a shortage. And to, to use the time wisely to think ahead to see where there's common ground that where in there where injury would be present prevented like what we've advocated for as a district. Um, and that did come out. And then I think also Mike Camblin offered um, some thoughts that maybe hopefully he'll follow up on too. And that so we could maybe down the road, if we get that defined more, we could talk about that and the and what Jackie Brown had brought up for the, on the industrial side. So there might be a couple of ideas. And you know, I, I do want to get back to Director Gray. I, I think um, there's a way in which those criteria could be outlined in a recommendation for legislation for any water conservation program. And that's why I, I just, yeah, there are variations and differences in yeah. each one of those types of programs. But in essence, you know, the question is, are there guiding principles or, or criteria that each, any one of those programs, whichever one the state eventually sets up, must follow? Exactly. And that's, that's what, um, you know, I think we, we certainly will try to advocate for. And I, I agree um, with Director Curry. I think um, some interesting ideas are coming up. It's just... How do you flush them out in the time period in which you need to? And I think, yeah, that's where the group is now, is that somebody can come forward with a good proposal on triggers. <laughs> that the, um, I think that the, all the, the groundwork has been done to, to move that forward. Dr. Monk. Yeah, quickly. So the, uh, I enjoyed the presentation from Lee or something talking about the water banking in the Arkansas. Yeah, um, I, I found that uh, enlightening and and very, uh, but the whole difference between the Arkansas and all of our river basins and us not having the science and the tools to come up with the consumptive use. We don't know what consumptive use is. I, I mean, every every field has different consumptive use based on the diversion and the rest. So I don't know. That, a whole lot of difference than down below Pueblo and the rest. So anyhow, I, I thought the discussion was good, but we have so many questions and tools to figure out how, how much water you're forgiven versus return flows. Yeah, thank you. That looks like it. Okay. The test All right, if we can maybe bring um, Don and DK up. Well, I did see Don just walk out, but <laughs> DK, you're on your own for now. Um, Let me uh, do a song and dance and stall. Yes. <laughs> We're done. So I can uh, start off and Don can join in. Yeah, build me up. Um, so you all have my memo, our memo, I should say. And uh, happy new water year to you all. Um, we're starting with a pretty large uh, uncertainty as we go into the next um, water year, next 12 months. Coming off a pretty good year, as you all know. And um, getting there. Wait a second so that the public can catch up, maybe. Well, while you're doing that, I'm just going to take a moment to um, make sure the board and public have met Bruce Walters, our new associate counsel. Um, greatly appreciate him to us from the um, uh, Colorado Attorney General's office. Um, had practiced previously on the Western Slope and understood where he really wanted to be. So we were <laughs> lucky that he came back. Um, and then Sam Callahan in the back um, is a water uh, resource. Uh, I'm going to get his name. His type a specialist. Yes, there we go. <laughs> um, there we go. And um, Sam is is great. Uh, great to have on board. He came to us from the Forest Service. Um, graduate of the School of Mines. Um, and uh, very happy to have both of them on the team. And in, uh, I think they're both at least living in town. So thank you for, and, and would encourage everybody to get to, to meet them uh, at uh, breaks and maybe even dinner tonight. So, and they get to Kool-Aid. 
Right. <laughs> we gotta give them some Kool-Aid. Yeah. Um, but now we're gonna turn to more two of our more senior employees in the district. And I mean that only by <laughs> only by tenure at the district. <laughs> All right, so as we were saying, happy water year, new water year. Um, as we move into this year, um, we're actually looking back, kind of a set of mixed messages, giving the headlines here. This is sort of what we're going to talk about in one slide. But um, 2023, above average moisture, but above average temperatures really led to what we uh, project is above average EVAP and transpiration. So probably a, a pretty big depletion based on what uh, was available. We use a lot of reservoir storage, but the reservoir storage um, uh, basically is strong and will have quite a bit of carryover as well. And when I say, I shouldn't have said reservoir storage, we, we really use what was in the river and the reservoir storage backed us up um, quite well. Going into 24, we're sort of in that wait and see, and the, the crystal ball is very cloudy. Um, we do know that uh, El Nino is, uh, the signals are strong. There's a significant warming in the Eastern Pacific. Why do we care? Well, that really indicates that um, the moisture could be there, especially in the Southern part of uh, the Colorado River Basin. It doesn't favor the northern uh, part of the basin as much. So we'll see how that signal plays out. But so for early planning, you know, um, what Reclamation has done uh, in conjunction with NOAA the, and the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center, they're looking at a 98% of average unregulated inflow of, of volume to basically <clears throat> simulate going forward. A huge amount of uncertainty. It's a, it's a conservative look ahead, right? So, um, but based on, in comparison to previous years, it's, it's pretty good. If we could get that, I think we'd all be pretty happy. Um, when you plug that into the formulas and the interim surplus, uh, interim guidelines that uh, determine how we operate Lakes Powell and Mead, um, Glen Canyon or Lake Powell will release seven and a half million acre feet. That's in the annual operating plan that's been published. It hasn't been signed, but uh, it's going through its process and there's a high likelihood unless something changes this winter um, that there'll be that sort of minimum objective release, um, if you wanna call it that. So what that means for the lower basin, they'll be in tier one shortage in 2024, which is actually a little better than what they were at. They were in tier two A shortage, uh, which is a deeper shortage. And in fact, this year, some of the lowest releases out of Lake Mead that have been recorded in the modern era, um, about 6 million acre feet for the, for the lower three basin states uh, consumptively. Um, and again, I mentioned that uh, Western Colorado, uh, looking forward to some reasonably healthy carryover storage, which um, helps us going forward, of course. Um, here's the signal that El Nino presents to us uh, warm uh, to the north and uh, a little bit dry in the north. And then in the south, you can see that green band on the right and maybe a touch of below normal temperatures, which is still pretty warm down there in the, in the southwest. Um, but that's sort of the classic El Nino pattern that, again, without a lot of additional information, that's what's fueling some of the forecasts that we're dealing with today. Mm -hmm. A high degree of uncertainty, I wanna repeat that. So we're not taking this to the bank. I think we all are gonna operate conservatively until we have uh, a better idea of our snowpack. Can we jump in now? Could you go back a slide for, for two slides? Two slides. I just wanna ask this question. When I look at your that in the middle there where it says the average unregulated inflow into PAL has been 9.6 over the last 30 years. Forecasting, you know, 9.4 is what uh, early water year 98% gets us. But what I have to ask is if that's the 30 year average, 
and the upper basin consumptive use has been four and a half. That's already taken out of that number. So the unregulated inflow as if depletions occur, but no reservoirs are up there. We take all the reservoir storage and all the reservoir retiming, we take that out, but the depletions stay in. So the 4.6, if that's the number you used, is in there. So you would add 4.6 to 9.6. Yes, so you're at 14. Yep. And so my question is, you know, we always say, well, back in 1922, they thought there was 15 million acre feet. Well, there was, in the last 30 years, there's been 14. And yes. if the uh, lower basin was using a million acre feet less than their 9.4 that they've been using, there would be no crisis. We would, we would be fine. Is that, am I, am I doing the math right? Yeah, um, I would say, yeah, I would say we should be asking them to use about a million and a half acre feet less. Yeah. Because it would bring them, uh, within their, um, take care of that event. Right. But, but that, that reservoirs would be sitting at least 50% full right now. Yeah, that's right. And so I guess it doesn't seem as complicated, you know, we're talking about, we just finished the discussion about, well, we might have to do some management and we're kind of creating some false crisis because we're trying to enable the lower basin of people to use it, what it appears to me. And, and the math isn't that complicated to, when you just look at that slide and go, well, four and a half and, and nine and a half is 14. Mm -hmm. So it's been a little drier than what than it was during those years leading up to the 22 compact. It hasn't been that much drier. It's, it's seriously that we that the lower basin has been taken over nine million acre feet instead of the yeah. Well, the, the river, I mean, I do want to say that I, I hear you, Tom, and I agree with, with you, but we also have to look at the kind of the trends in the river and, and um, you know, 10 years prior to 2023 we were averaging about a 12.4 million acre foot of rain. In the five years prior to 2022, it was closer to about 11.5. And, and so it, it, if, if that trend generally continues, right, that's where we end up, you, you know, it, it depends on, on which scientist you talk to, but, but there are pr reasonable predictions that, that could drive us down to even 9 million or 9.5 million acre feet on a, on a running, uh, average and and that's when you can get the lower basin to live within their their uh, compact. Um, I'm not going to use their term. I'm not going to use the term entitlement. The compact allotment um, that 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 if if they are using within their allotment, we could still end up in a situation where where the, there is a crisis on because it's just that much less water, right? Um, but but the first step is to fix the leak. Yeah, yeah, right. Yes, that the leak down. Yeah, yeah. But when you're in a hole, you can't get out of quick dig. Yeah, and uh, no, I, I think it's incumbent upon the upper basin to be reasonable, and if and and say, well, if if then you know if it's that dry, we have a ten million acre foot river because of climate change or whatever the reason is, then we will have to figure out ways to curtail some of our use as well but uh it it just seems like that conversation gets escalated past all of that and it's we're in a crisis and we and we now are going to start talking about ways to be useful. Yeah. so i, I that's, that's my rant i just seen that and i want to go back to our regularly scheduled program <laughs> thank you um nice we, uh, we find ourselves looking uh, at uh, some drought creeping back in to our reality. You know, last time I was in front of you, the rectangle that is Colorado was totally white. We had no drought, uh, indications at all. So now um, you can see that uh, while it's not severe or extreme in any way or exceptional, um, it is creeping up from the south. The good news is if you look at California, all white. And of course, that's one of the reasons why it's easier for them not to uh, consume as much this year. Um, but you'll see Arizona, pretty dry. Utah, which was extremely wet, set records this year, is now starting to see a little bit of dryness creeping in. 
Can, we, can you hold on for just a minute? I do want to just point out one of the fixes we often hear the Colorado River Basin is a, a Missouri River pipeline um, or something out of the Mississippi system. And this is a really interesting map to look at from that perspective. And um, I, I imagine many of you have seen the press covering the saltwater intrusion into the Mississippi River because of that dark red blob in Louisiana and um, Arkansas and, or Mississippi um, and, and, and Alabama there. And um, you go up into the headwaters and it's also in drought on the Mississippi. Um, you know, this is not the time to open up discussions with those states about taking a significant amount of water out of their base. Just, just pointing out that, you know, this is, um, that pipe may be a pipe dream and just, Remember that when you when you hear easy solutions, there's there's variable weather in a lot of places. So, so. thank you for that context. So again, moving on here, uh, something you'll recall: records wet in eastern Colorado um, or central Colorado. If you will, John's going to touch on this. It it really changed uh, the picture this year for us. We had some significant rains, as you can see here, just here in Garfield County. Um, and it was made it a very enjoyable year for us with low fire risk until very recently. Um, and so what that did is it combined with one of my favorite plots, which as an engineer, you may not agree. You know, um, anytime you're above this green area, this is a cumulative plot, okay? If you have a totalizer, which we do on the end of the river, the higher it is, the more water that goes, the blue is record high, the green is sort of the 75, 25. This is where you want to be. And we have moved from a deficit down here in the orange in this year to sort of almost at above average conditions in the Colorado. This is at, at the state line. And this is a long-term record. So really good news, this plot. Uh, we, we look at this on a regular basis, but again, shows us how far we've come in a short amount of time. The other thing that we're seeing, of course, not quite record um, recovery, but Lake Powell from record lows to back into something we've experienced before, um, upwards of about 50 to 60 feet of gain. Um, it's tailing off a little bit, but not precipitously. And we're hoping that we can continue to go sideways in this plot or go up with this next year to get into um, more uh, familiar territory. And so you'll see that in some subsequent plots. Uh, this plot, we'd like to show our external affairs, Lindsay, uh, external affairs specialist. Lindsay no, Lindsay. no, deputy director. director uh, deputy director, <laughs> you get it? <laughs> Kudos um, for this plot um, that we pull out. You can see good recovery in the upper basin, uh, Blue Mesa, um, Flaming Gorge, Navajo, pretty near full going into the winter, Lake Powell, Lake Mead, about 40%, 30, 35%. And by the end of the year, uh, system storage uh, should be around 40%. And when you look at this, um, maybe for, for Director Gray, kind of showing the variability where we are average on the right-hand side of the plot is kind of the projected 2024, uh, four times a year. Reclamation runs their model for the minimum probable, their most probable, and their maximum probable to capture about 80% of the uh, protect, projected variability. Um, so we would we are projected just below average right now with a lot of uncertainty. Um, and you can kind of see where that fits, but a huge amount of variability between minimum probable and maximum probable. And when you run it through the operational model, you get this spaghetti plot, which really drives home the uncertainty. Um, where we are today in the black line, uh, intersecting with basically December, at the start of the calendar year, when the uncertainty <clears throat> grows between that minimum probable, most probable, and maximum probable, uh, you can see where elevation-wise, Lake Powell is projected to end up. And each one of these tiers, you've seen this before, hopefully you'll get more and more fam familiar and comfortable with this, but these are the, the tiers that are operational tiers within 
the interim guidelines, which are going to be subject to renewal and renegotiation. Um, and so by the end of next calendar year, 2024, there's 100 feet of difference between the minimum and the maximum. Hopefully we end up uh, closer to the green or, or to the blue, excuse me, but more likely somewhere in the green. And we're in this more familiar territory of the upper elevation balancing tier. Um, and so that's kind of, again, the best guess, um, best science on where we're gonna end up uh, over the next 24 months. They do the same thing for Lake Mead. And so Lake Powell, just to remind you, is really driven by the water supply conditions, the snowpack, Lake Mead, as we just discussed about how much they're taking out uh, and their usage. They uh, base this on uh, or water orders and, and projected water orders. And um, again, you can see that widespread. We're, we're pretty confident the next six months where we're going to be, 12 months, a little less, but more than likely, they're going to stay in this range of level one storage between 1050 and 1075 feet above mean sea level for Lake Mead and uh, Hoover Dam. So um, you may ask, well, what does that mean for our long-term um, compact compliance and non-depletion uh, obligations? What that, what Volume of water passes the Lee Ferry. Um, this is basically historical in the blue and the projected next two years of seven and a half million acre feet passing Lee Ferry. What would that mean? Uh, it means we're well above the running average, which is in red, above 82 and a half million acre feet uh, and way above 75 million acre feet over 10, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're in relatively good shape. We have a buffer. We're not in danger of busting our compact compliance. So I'm gonna, uh, now that I've painted the picture of the regional, we'll come into the, the local watersheds and Don will take it from here. Great, thanks DK. Uh, just a real quick rundown on the runoff. Um, I'm sure everybody's fairly familiar with, um, with the very good conditions in some Cases, great conditions of the runoff this year. Um, the AMP at nearly 150% of average. Uh, Elkhead a little higher than that. Uh, the white at 150-ish. Um, and of course, the main of Colorado looking pretty good. Wolford, 109% of average, but uh, we filled it. And uh, Gunnison at uh, about the 150% average sort of. Uh, are there Blue Mesa 133% of average and it actually got up to 91% full. Uh, I think DK's uh, Mariel's or uh, Lindsay's uh, chief up diagram showed um, something like 76%. I think that's after uh, the uh, obligations uh, since then. The lower is at 214% of average, San Juan way up there. Uh, Navajo now 76% full. Uh, Lake Powell at a uh, 166% of average in full, uh, and 37% full. That was its maximum. So we had uh, June precipitation on the east slope, as DK pointed out. And I think that uh, earlier, see the inset here, his earlier slide showed uh, a water year, I think, precipitation, but this is almost identical in terms of um, the intensity of uh, the bullseye here over the the east slope. So June was extremely wet, uh, record wet, right? Everybody remembers those. <clears throat> a couple of weeks there in June. Uh, on the west slope, June precipitation was uh, less stellar. Uh, and then July was very dry. Next slide. And then through August, September, and October, uh, August brought uh, the remnants of Hillary, um, which um, provided for quite a bit of precipitation to the north in the northwest state of uh, the state and, and drier in the south. Uh, September was very dry even for September. Now September is a sort of a drying month in terms of the uh, monsoonal uh, activity. And then October we see today has been um, below average uh, in many parts of the, uh, of the west slope. 
with the exception of laptops in the room, plateau, and so forth. Uh, so there we are in terms of precipitation. Um, we mentioned all that moisture in June on the, on the east slope, and what that resulted in on the west slope was quite a bit of water that was anticipated to be taken over, uh, over the continental divide and instead was released or spilled um, gross reservoir in this expansion mode uh, during, during their um, construction, they can't take as much water. And then in, in addition, all this water that became available on the East Slope um, caused um, a, a bunch of water come down on the West side here. Um, and likewise, the Roberts Tunnel um, went to zero for a long time there. Um, really, uh, Kremlin was sort of the epicenter for this. This is a Kremlin plot. I can see how that um, actual seasonal peak occurred, um, you know, actually a little bit late relative to the average, but um, it was really the west, very wet conditions on the east slope that caused this late seasonal uh, bump in the river, uh, 5,500 CF Kremlin. Next slide. Um, okay, uh, Lake Granby. Uh, Obviously, uh, it was involved there uh, because the Adams Tunnel was shut off. It spilled uh, copiously, uh, you know, helping cause that big, uh, late season peak. Hello, uh, next slide. And on the Roaring Fork uh, near Aspen, here we see that when Twin Lakes Tunnel shut down uh, because it was so wet um, on the on the east slope um, north there. We had a plethora um, of, of water run through for about two, three weeks through Aspen there and on down, causing a late seasonal peak, uh, very interesting here. Um, and then Wolford, Wolford Ops, um, <coughs> went on in the slide, but uh, we had about 900 CFS come in uh, early on, another, again, uh, about 100%, 110% of average inflow. And then later in the season, we had releases for the fish. Um, coincidentally, the releases were uh, also initiated out of root eye and they shifted some of that because of the um, anglers below root eye were concerned. So we had 160 CFS for four or five days come out of Wolford because of that shift uh, by the recovery program. And there was this little blip, uh, the Mosier exchange after all that fish water went out. We maintained 35 CFS out of the out of the reservoir. You note that the storage is much higher than it was last year. Um, so we decided we would uh, increase a little bit uh, beyond the 20 CFS minimum. Um, that gave us the exchange potential to exchange only 13 acre feet of Mosier water because it was so wet. Green Mountain couldn't capture that uh, full 73 acre feet. And then uh, again, we're continuing to release 35 CFS, and we still have some exchange potential. And as it turns out, um, we'll see in, in, in the next slide, I think. Um, and this is the um, bypass channel construction at Windy Gap. Uh, they are very uh, close to uh, ready to fill that reservoir. I think um, you can see the, the plan view, the map, uh, the red arrow shows the panorama uh, location of that photo. If you look straight down, you can see the new dam, uh, just to the left of center in the photo. And uh, the old dam to the right, uh, hard to see there, but they're deconstructing the old dam. And the new dam now is <clears throat> reducing the uh, capacity from 400 to 255 acre feet. Mm -hmm. But they are going to be ready to fill this reservoir at about a foot a day. And uh, the request has been made to um, exchange that water <clears throat> from Wolford. Okay, so just a, an FYI that we do have that exchange potential as we maintain that 35 CFS. Uh, so the new, uh, new dam is going to be uh, built here starting late October and into November. Um, so that operation, if, if we decide that's kosher, we'll go ahead and, and cause that to happen. 
Um, again, this is a, an extra over a mile of stream that didn't exist prior to this connectivity channel activity, uh, open to the public for fishing, uh, wetlands, uh, additional wetlands and so forth. Um, so they're nearing completion here at Windy Gap. Next slide. That was just, <clears throat> for those of you who may be newer to the board, that was our first CFP grant. Um, uh, a million dollar grant right off the bat that this board authorized. So it was um, a small percentage of that project. I want to say that project is what, $28 million project at this point. So uh, go ahead. Sorry. Go. And uh, so that's uh, a project at Windy Gap, that uh, Connected the Channel project that Northern is, uh, I think, uh, going the extra mile for. On the other, other side of the hill, this is the Chimney Hollow uh, construction, uh, very interesting construction where the, the actual core of the dam is a three foot wide asphalt, um, sort of a dike, if you will. It's very interesting uh, construction and that's ongoing here. Uh, next slide, we have the Moffat expansion, which involves, again, um, the uh, rays of gross uh, reservoir dam. Uh, you can see in this picture where it's drawn down, you know, it certainly has helped us this year, last year as well, and it will help us in the next few years until they actually get the thing constructed, um, but they won't be able to take as much water. But that, uh, that raise is gonna be 131 feet and increase the capacity from 42,000 to 112,000 acres. Excellent. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask, did you climb up there at Chimney Hollow and get that picture? Being <laughs> climbed, did you look at my phone? So here we have the Yamp. I'm going to move on to uh, the northern uh, area here. Uh, uh, pretty good peak this year, much higher than the 90th percentile, a uh, little early, uh, 15,000, 16,000 CFS. But you notice as the hydrograph drops um, in uh, mid-June, we begin to see that we're coming out of the upper percentile and closer to the average uh, flow in the river and uh, continue at about uh, the 50th percentile. Um, and you know, we, we did release some water out of Elkhead um, and we did um, enhance those flows up to about 200 CFS and that was the that's kind of the wet your target at, at Mayville here. Next slide. Um, here we are with uh, Elkhead releases. Uh, again, 70 CFS was the maximum out. Um, we are um, quite a bit above actually last year's and, and previous years were uh, much uh, reduced storage. Um, so the storage is, is a little bit higher than last year, quite a bit higher than uh, 2021. Um, so we're, I think we got five CFS coming out. I think we're going to increase to 10 CFS to, to tamp down that, uh, that storage. Um, so there we are uh, maintaining, trying to maintain 200 CFS at Maybell out of Elkin. So. Rangely uh, gauge on the white here, um, a couple of different peaks of about 3,500, 3,400 CFS. Uh, a good year. Um, again, more recently in late August and September, we have uh, dropped from the upper uh, 70, uh, 50 to 70 percent uh, percentile to about uh, the average. And actually, recently, uh, a little bit below average. Next slide. And at the at the Gunnison gauge, and I, I'll hand this off to DK, but. Uh, you know, a couple of actually three different peaks, uh, unique peaks. Uh, the two later peaks were actually caused by operations uh, at the Aspen unit. So uh, I'll let DK take it from here. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we brought this to your attention last time. Typically, we don't have an operation that re, uh, results in two distinct peaks, um, but this year we did. First one, mostly geared towards the endangered fish targets. Uh, just above Grand Junction, and whereas the second one was re is really geared towards the local peak in the Black Canyon, which was not achieved. You can see it's a higher peak here uh, below the Gunnison Tunnel, 
So uh, another release was made to achieve a one day peak for the Black Canyon decree. And so um, we had the flexibility to do that. When I say we reclamation, of course, making these decisions in consultation with water users um, because New Mesa had this spectacular recovery from record low to almost full, 92%, I think, was the highest. Um, and we're, we're still in the green, meaning we have good carryover, as I mentioned, and a good chance of filling again next year with an average year. As we look ahead um, in the near term, we, we looked at the, the seasonal look, right? With wetter in the north and uh, drier to the south. I said that backwards, excuse me. Uh, drier to the north in El Nino and wetter to the south. Here um, in the 8 to 14 day, uh, a little wetter across the west, uh, even cooler. Uh, we've had a nice cool uh, streak here that's going to continue for the next uh, week to two weeks. And looking out, you can see situations starting to change with the projection being warmer than average across basically the entire United States with still uh, kind of a wet signal uh, in the west. This is only looking out 30 days. And then again, the seasonal three month has got that sort of equal chances across the, the headwaters of the Colorado and green. And so not a lot uh, to go on. And that's why we're looking at average to slightly below average sort of projections for modeling. So that's kind of where we're at for right now. Happy to keep discussing or hand it back over to you all. Any questions for EK or Don? One question, um, EK, on your slides that show the cone of uncertainty at Lakes mm -hmm. Powell and Mead. If we, if we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but we've always the cone of uncertainty at Powell is always much wider, bigger degree of uncertainty at Lake Powell than at Lake Mead, as you noted, because of the <coughs> Lake Mead is driven really primarily by um, uh, lower basin uses. One of the points that we made in our comment letter to the Bureau of Reclamation on their pre um, uh, comments on, on uh, uh, post-2026 operations, and I believe the state of Colorado made a similar point, um, maybe other upper basin states did as well, was that, um, that the uh, conjunctive operation of the reservoirs should uh, um, more directly address actual um, the current year or you know relative current year uh, inflow hydrology. What, if anything, would doing that have on the respective cone of uncertainties at the reservoirs? Well, I mean, the, the uncertainty is pointed out and to reinforce is we don't know what the snowpack is going to be really. I mean, all the plots I show and the projections speak to that. And so I don't think we can narrow a whole lot, um, you know, from 12 to 24 months. Um, these are based on sort of historical uh, reprojection of, of history and, and to a small degree paleo history. But in the next 12 months, I think is where you're going. You get much more certainty if you know um, uh, essentially your operations nailed down. What happens now is there is a chance to adjust or change the seven and a half million acre feet in April, which gives that flexibility to, to reclamation, but widens the uncertainty, I guess. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough nut to crack to, to really narrow this down, having a system that really pins us to an uncertain hydrology. There's not much we can do, but when you get to Lake Mead, I think your certainty band narrows because of those operations. The only uncertainty here are the side inflows, which again is significant. You can go from 300,000 acre feet to one and a half million acre feet of side inflows. And so it's, it's a tough one when it comes to projecting out beyond 12 months, I guess is, is essentially the answer, the unfortunate answer to, to give. Else. 
Thank you. Question. Um, so PK mentioned that in April they could revisit the 7.48 release. And I'm assuming that would be if the hydrology pushed us into a different tier. Is that right? Yeah, so the, the interim guidelines look at both Lake Powell and Lake Mead elevations. And this is where some of the gaming or some of the suspicion about gaming occurs with releases in the lower basin to depress those elevations, right? Um, so basically this time of year, even though we're not growing anything up here, there can be strong demands down below for places like Yuma. And so we don't really know what those demands are uh, even. they All they do, the, the states give reclamation schedule basically at the start of the year and every month they can adjust those. So um, that's a little bit additional uncertainty, I think is where we're going. But basically when they make the April adjustments typically related to uh, inflow hydrology, snowpack, and the projections, what elevation we would be relative to at, at Lake Mead versus Lake, Lake Powell as it is against Lake Mead. If they get out of balance, so to speak, then they make the adjustment to release some more. Um, next item is the district office remodel update. Uh, Audrey Turner, our chief of operations, has a quick update. Well, I'm not asking for action today. <laughs> Better place to be in. Uh, just thought I would give everyone an update. So since July, you may recall that the board delegated authority to the executive committee for the contract approval um, for our office remodel. And so the executive committee did meet September 11th and approved um, our authorized general manager to enter into a contract with Rudd Construction for our office remodel. So we've been really gearing up for that um, and just wanted to provide some details on the on what it will look like for our staff during that time and some other items. Um, so we have a start date planned and so far we're, we're on schedule for November 6th. Um, we do anticipate it to take roughly five to six months from the time we move out until the time of completion, um, assuming all goes to plan. Um, we do have our office space down here that the enterprise owns, and we have intentionally kept that um, unoccupied after our last tenants moved out so that we could utilize that space for staff during the remodel. And then we also were able to secure um, some additional space uh, just down the hallway as well for, for our staff. So we anticipate having, you know, roughly 10 to 12 people in the office um, on a daily basis so that we'll be able to have continued operations um, also with the hybrid environment. So some staff will be working remote um, and other staff will be in the office so that we can continue to have sort of the collaboration um, connection points. Um, and I think that, you know, we've mentioned this before, we were kind of forced into remote work during COVID. It was uh, not the smoothest transition, but we have since really developed a lot of the tools for, for virtual work um, and in a hybrid environment. And so um, we feel pretty confident that we'll be successful with that model. Um, we also have been on, on the contract. Um, we did util utilize outside counsel to do the uh, construction drafting and, and contract negotiations, um, which has been really helpful um, in that process as well. And then just as a reminder, some of the goals for the remodel, um, we're, we're creating more office space for, we're going to have 23 offices for our Glenwood Springs based staff, um, which we are now fully staffed at 25 employees. Two of those in um, that we're going to do a significant amount of sort of sound mitigation measures in there, including new drywall insulation um, and better ceiling, acoustic ceiling tiles, which will really uh, improve I think, the working environment um, and also uh, improve confidentiality for some of the conversations that folks are having in their individual offices. 
Um, and then we're also going to be doing upgraded energy efficient light fixtures, um, bringing our restrooms to be ADA compliant. Um, and then, yeah, creating sort of collaboration spaces as well that it really matches more of our, our work style and environment in, in today's world. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention to the board, just so you're prepared, uh, we recognize that construction is going to be disruptive. And so for we'll, we'll be in the midst of that project during our January board meeting. And so we do have a meeting room um, reserved at the Mortgage Commons, uh, which we have met there before. And so we'll make that call as we get closer to the January meeting, just kind of depending on where we're at in construction. Uh, we just want to make sure that it's our meeting is, is not disruptive, disruptive and will be as productive as possible. So that's kind of the update. Happy to answer any questions if the board, the board has any of those. Questions for Aubrey? So the stationery, they going to use this a lot as a impact your tenants at all or staging? Yeah, yeah. So staging will impact them slightly. Um, we, the contractors are planning on using the back area of the parking lot um, with a trash chute and loading materials through a lift through the windows on our second floor. So there will be a couple parking spaces um, where that will be lost for the staging of that. My guess is that won't be the biggest complaint. It'll be probably more, you know, the noise the other tenants, but you know it's something that we have to do and we haven't done in a long time um the third floor is also remodeling their restrooms with the same contractor in the same time frame as well and so we're just going to try to get it done as fast as we can i said i saw the outdoor work going on today i hated to see them come in with Equipment over a few areas. Oh, no, it won't. They won't be on any of the, the landscaped areas. It'll just be on the, the concrete um, and the asphalt in the back parking area. Oh, what a collaboration area is in today's work environment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it wouldn't offend you. I mean, it's got like a pool table and a baseball <laughs> table. I mean, no. No, you're no, going to let us do, put a game room in the. <laughs> it's, it's just a, a, a meeting space that's. Um, not as formal as a conference room. And, and it, we find a lot of our teams get together kind of ad hoc, say, hey, I need to talk to two other people. And, they, and it will have a seating area where they can sit and talk. So, okay. And a sushi bar. <laughs> and the sushi bar is part of that. But I, you know. <laughs> I wish, I wish I'll be something. Uh, I asked you, Mental hospital down at Grand Junction it has something with a similar name that you go in and they turn on lights. And it's supposed to be confusing. Well, make sure that we're going that direction. There are times where our employees do need to feel better. I know. We could have incorporated so many more things. When we're finished, are we going to release these spaces? Then we'll give up the one lease and then release, we'll release the space. this space down. And we can accommodate the. 25 or we can go up to 27 now. I mean, are we look into the future. Um, for yeah, upstairs we will, we will, we're building offices for 25, but we actually have two additional kind of work flex spaces so it could handle 27. We always have this, this space down here to, um, if we uh, uh, need it as we, if, if we grow in the future. So. But, but we don't keep it vacant in the meantime, right? We're going to, okay. Yeah. We would intend to release. Okay. Lease that again. Yeah. And we've executed the contract, right? So we've got a fixed price, or this thing keeps going up. No, this is a fixed price. It hasn't gone up since uh, the last time we talked. Um, it it um, uh, we've not yet executed the contract. Our lawyers and their lawyers are going back and forth. Not our inside lawyers, but our outside counsel on on some of the terms, uh, just to make sure we get it. Questions. Next slide. Um, uh, scooter, do you want to take it from there? Uh, he's on a scooter uh, oftentimes. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe not. Uh, excuse me, uh, Director of uh, Financial and Administrative uh, Resources, Ian Phillips. Um, if anybody's looking for uh, advice on how to ride a bird bike, um, Ian would be happy to give you a, a, some pointers. Um, Ian has a request for approving an auditor. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, the action uh, requested in front of you today is to uh, authorize the um, uh, president to sign the engagement letter to retain our auditors for Mc, uh, McMahon and Associates for the year 2023. Um, we hired McMahon in 2018. We've used them every year since. We tried to, um, I went out and tried to find another firm this year. Um, you know, the last time we went through this process, uh, it was very clear from the board, they wanted to hire a firm within our district. So we left the firm that was in Kansas City, hired McMahon and Associates at Bedwards. Um, so I searched uh, some firms on the West Slope. Unfortunately, the, um, the big one that we wanted to use uh, closed up shop in Grand Junction. So that really didn't allow for too many uh, alternatives on, within our district on the West Slope. I did contact a firm on the Front Range, a painting and company, great firm, uh, very familiar with governments and even water districts and conservation districts. Um, unfortunately, their bid came in uh, about 43% higher than McMahon and Associates. And within their uh, bid was about two to $3,000 of travel and first time client costs. So my recommendation is to retain McMahon and Associates at the not to exceed amount of $20,000 Comments, questions? I move staff recommendation. Second. Second. Whitmore, second by Rober. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, the spike rate was that easy. One point on, on the um, Ian's discussion about um, going out and soliciting other potential firms is not any concern with mayhem. Right. It's just the practice of trying to occasionally, yep. you know, change up your auditor. And, uh, and I just want to connect that too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You know, we uh, it's advised we uh, you know look at new auditing firms every five years uh, so that the auditor doesn't get too comfortable with our practice and miss something. It's basically just to keep fresh eyes on our books. So I'm hoping that we can get somebody in for the 2024 audit. Hopefully the vacuum created in Grand Junction by this firm leading will build will have more opportunities for a good firm. Okay. Um, yeah, it's four left, four word. I can tell you. Yep. Okay. Outstanding water candidates in the Yampa, Colorado Eagle and Marine Corps River Basin. Rebecca is going to lead that discussion. I think Raquel Clinker is online. Um, so Rebecca and Raquel put together a memo and we can work on this. Work um, presentation. No action item is requested here, but certain direction always ask. And Raquel is uh, working remotely today only because she has a uh, cold and was thoughtful enough not to spread it among directors. So thank you. You're welcome. What's that say about the stay? All right, thank you, Nancy. Um, so I'm going to talk today about Outstanding Waters. There is um, currently an effort for um, new candidate reaches within the Upper Colorado River Basin within our state for Outstanding Waters designation. And I'm just going to go through that um, process and uh, those efforts and what that means for um, waters within our district. <laughs> Um, so for some background on outstanding waters, through the Clean Water Act of 1972, states and tribes have the authority to set up water quality um, protections within their state or region. Um, and this is done in Colorado through the Water Quality Control Commission and the Water Quality Control Division. 
Um, within Regulation 33, which is the basic standards and methodologies for surface water regulation, which sets up those water quality protections, um, there is an anti-degradation rule. Within that de anti-degradation rule, which is what we're focusing on today with outstanding waters, um, there's provisions that ensure that water quality protections um, are you know, held at the standards that exist and that water uses are not um, limited by degrading water quality. Well, are we going to interrupt you as you go along? Or? Please do, if you have questions <laughs> as you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, if I could. Please. Yeah. So back to your last. Sure. So to make sure that they're not uh, degraded any more, any less, or whatever. Yeah. How's that any different than anything already? Yeah, my next slide will be okay. <laughs> Keep going then. I mean, I looked through the slides, but okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question, Director Munger, and that's addressed um, specifically through three different tiers that are set up in these anti-degradation designations. There's three different levels of de designation. The first one is use protected waters, which applies to all waters within Colorado, and that's just as you say, Director Munger, that it's the basic standards that apply. There's certain table value standards and other limits for pollutant levels, um, which can be um, you know, had in, in all of these waters, and if it exceeds that pollutant level, it's placed on the TMDL list um, and it, uh, the 303 d list and considered an impaired water. Um, so that use protected waters is what applies to protect existing uses with those implied, with those implemented water quality standards. The next level of protection is reviewable waters, which has that same level of protection with an additional protection that no significant degradation is allowed to occur within that stream for a river segment. And the highest level of protection is outstanding waters protection, which means that no permanent degradation is allowed. This means that any new or increased pollution is prohibited um, and that only temporary or minor um, increases in pollution or degradation is permitted. So for example, a discharge permit that would increase a certain pollutant would not be allowed to exist within that outstanding water designation. So for an outstanding waters designation to um, be applied to a stream segment, it is held to pretty high standards. Um, there's three key areas that it has to have um, to, to qualify. The first is it has to have high quality, exist, high water quality um, already, and that's measured by three, 12 different parameters, pH, dissolved oxygen, nitrate, E. coli, and ammonia, and then seven dissolved metals, cadmium, copper, lead, manganese, selenium, silver, and zinc. Um, it has to have exceptional recreational or ecological significance, which, for example, could mean it's a gold water fishery, um, it could be in a wilderness area or a national park. And then it also needs to demonstrate a need to be protected against degradation beyond the existing classification or beyond that existing um, protection with the use classified. So does a bike path qualify for ex exceptional recreation opportunities? Probably not. <laughs> it has right. to have a, a probably a higher level than that. Um, generally, where we've seen <laughs> outstanding water designations are in high elevation areas. Um, that really don't have a whole lot of human use or impact. Okay. So in terms of impacts um, that Outstanding Waters has on, on water rights, that was a concern for us in looking into this. Um, per the Regulation 31 and Colorado Revised Statute, um, Section 25, there is not authority for water quality um, protections to have impacts to uh, to water rights. Um, so it's not allowed to cause injury to water rights. And then any outstanding waters designation is not allowed to impact existing water uses. So if there's an existing stormwater discharge permit within that segment, those activities are allowed to continue as long as they don't increase in pollution or bring any new pollution to that segment. And then additionally, agriculture and grazing is considered a non-point source. So that is not regulated by the Water Quality Control Commission um, in Colorado. Um, and so grazing permits are not affected in these lands um, because it's, it's just not regulated by them. So moving from that background into what's happening now, there's um, 
the Colorado River Basin Outstanding Waters Coalition, which is a, a wide ranging group of environmental NGOs regionally and, and state focused. Um, they're working together to propose um, multiple new outstanding waters designations within the upper Colorado River Basin. Um, and these are located across our district um, on the upper Colorado River Basin, Big Alkali Creek, which is located about 10 miles um, north of Eagle, Colorado, um, just south of the Colorado River. On the lower Colorado River Basin, East Fork Parachute Creek, um, about five miles west of Rifle on the Rome Plateau. Within the Roaring Fork Basin, Woody Creek and Hunter Creek, which are located east of Aspen. Avalanche Creek and South and Middle Thompson Creek, which are tributaries to the Crystal River south of Carbondale. Um, Brush Creek, which includes East and West Fork Brush Creek in the Eagle River Basin. And then quite a few here in the Yampa River Basin. Again, these are um, mostly all within uh, Forest Service land and high elevation areas. Um, in the Yampa River Basin, we have Elkhead Creek, which is really just the headwaters that doesn't extend all the way down to Elkhead Reservoir. Um, and then in the Little Snake, or sorry, yeah, Little Snake River, Middle Fork, Little Snake River, and King Solomon Creek. And then the Middle, North, and South Fork, Elk River, and Hinman Creek in the Elk River Basin up near the Umpa. And then east of Steamboat Springs, Soda Creek, Fish Creek, and Walton Creek. Um, and all of these reaches are located almost entirely or um, almost entirely uh, within U.S. Forest Service land or BLM land, which is just small segments um, through private property or, or other lands. So the process to get these outstanding waters reaches designated as that um, this coalition is going through a multi-year process to establish the qualifications for these reaches. Um, and a big part of that is establishing that ecological or recreational significance. It does have to be quite a bit um, more significant than just a bike path. It has to show that there's threatened and endangered species or um, that there's real value to maintaining this um, water quality beyond what already exists. And then there has to be multi-year monitoring and sampling to demonstrate that those 12 key parameters are met. If one of those key parameters says is beyond the standard that's allowed, it's not gonna be considered as um, outstanding water because it already is exceeding that threshold. And those, um, that coalition that's working on this, they've already been doing water sampling for about a year and a half to make sure that that sampling is relatively long-term and also taking place in all four seasons. And they're expected to finish their water quality sampling this upcoming spring. And then they're also working on um, contacting locals, um, stakeholder groups, cities, counties, water conservancy districts, landowners, businesses, et cetera, to make sure that anybody who's within this reach is aware of what's going on. And so there have been several newspaper articles um, within this area and also in um, Steamboat, I saw one, and they've had public meetings as well to inform people um, what's going on and, and have reached out to River District staff as well. And then in terms of the process to get it um, designated by the Water Quality Control Commission, within Colorado, each basin has a, a triannual cycle review for each basin to go through its um, water quality regulation. And the Upper Colorado is due for its uh, rulemaking hearing this upcoming summer in June of 2024. This is the third year of this three-year process. It started in October of 2022 with the issues scoping hearing, which is basically the process to um, bring up any potential revisions that are going to be brought to the Water Quality Control Commission. And right now we're in year two of that process. Um, next month in November, these proposed reaches will be presented to the Water Quality Control Commission um, for their uh, review, and they will make a decision on whether each reach qualifies and should receive an outstanding waters designation in June of next year at the rulemaking hearing. So at this time, we're not looking for any board action. Um, this is informational only, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions or take any recommendations. Questions for Rebecca? Yes, Director Randall. Just one. If there's threatened endangered species that are, to have this designation, has to be a teeny species in there? 
No, not be, necessarily. Or there can be. There could be. Okay, okay. Because I would, I would think if there is already T and E species in there, there would also be, there would already be some sort of new require or requirements imposed upon you to maintain that existing water quality, that anti degradation clause. That would be part of it. Right. So, and yeah, and outstanding waters is really kind of like a above and beyond protection. So there's existing protections everywhere, and the outstanding waters is um, just really a very high bar of protection. Okay. So yeah. I misunderstood you. Then. Thank you. Oh, I apologize for that, Director Monger. So yeah, this very much concerns me, especially the ones in my neighborhood. Okay. So and again, what's the U.S. Forest Service say about all that stuff? So they have been working with the U.S. Forest Service. Um, I don't know the exact conversation that they've been having, but I do know that they're working with them to make sure that the U.S. Forest Service does not change any of their grazing permits. And they've said that there is no impact to grazing permits within their areas. So I guess I, my other, uh, so I have a couple of questions here. I, I'm just concerned that, you know, it creates quasi wilderness. Yeah. And then the second thing is, is that we're protecting it from what, you know, and, and again, the Forest Service has all the tools in the world. And I'm not shooting the messenger here, so I'm just, uh, yeah, these very much concern me coming from the source that they're coming from. You know, and again, so I, I, again, I know those areas and what's out there now, there is nothing out there, maybe a little bit. So I guess, and then you say, well, we're gonna put a bike path out there and the rest, you know, and I guess there's a process to put it on. What's the process to take it off? <laughs> Yeah, there really, to my knowledge, there isn't a process to take it off to, you know, maybe assuage your concerns a little bit. A bike path would not have probably any issues. I mean, we have the mad rabbit trails mm -hmm. that are going from Rabbiter's Pass all the way to Clark. And they're all the way through all of this stuff. And then I get really concerned when I start seeing these maps that's been presented, you know, and some of them are kind of located next to the, uh, next to the creek. Depends on who drew the map. And then these other ones have these blankets that cover everything around everything. So I, I, I get very concerned about this. And, and again, I, I, I'm not very trustworthy and it's a land grab. So anyhow, I, um, and at the same point in time, I'm not gonna lay on a sword here for it, so. Director Munger, I understand your concerns. And maybe just to kind of clarify, maybe meant to yeah, explain this well, but it, it wouldn't <coughs> it would only impact somebody's attempt to get a discharge or a stormwater permit. So mm -hmm. if someone wants to build a, a bike path that's not requiring a discharge permit, likely um, they could maybe need a stormwater permit for the construction, but since that would be temporary and minor, they would probably allow that it would not be an impact. It would only potentially impact, let's say you want to build a wastewater treatment plant in that area and discharge to the stream. Um, that permit would likely not go through an outstanding waters. So definition. how would it go through with Forest Service anyhow? I mean, I mean, this is an added protection. I understand that. And, and again, I, I don't know. And then the meetings, you know, they're not, they're not that... You know, we bring in our friends that are all in favor of this without having a conversation. The people that are concerned as me about the other unintended consequences that come with the stuff. So anyhow, I'll, I'll shut up. Thank you very much. Dr. Whitmore. Well, uh, to follow up on your concerns, I mean, none of these are in my backyard, um, but in my prior experience with outstanding waters, it has all sorts of implications for 404 permits, 402 permits, 401, you know, certifications, but it can also be the basis, I think, for something objecting to a water rights application for a new right or for changing a right or, you know, doing anything on the, because the standard here is no degradation. Dr. McGinnis. Yeah, so something similar, a little different, but in Mesa County, where the Colorado River goes through that stretch there, which there's a lot of users on that thing. The fish and wildlife wanted to protect a bird, the cuckoo bird or something like that. I remember that. Yeah, hadn't been yeah. spotted in our county ever. Even our local division of wildlife, at that time was the division of wildlife, said that it was not a nesting area for it. But what's happened with conservation easements 
which are perpetuity in almost all of these federal funds. So most of that land along the river is private land or on top. So when they came and they put all kinds of stuff like this, they were going to put it on. If in fact, they could show it was a nesting area, which they claimed happened, even though the State Division of Wildlife said it's not a nesting area, they never spotted one. By the way, you don't have to spot it. All you have to do is hear it. And to hear it, you don't have to be an expert. You can just call them and say, I think I heard a cougar bird, and they put that as a hearing. That's what, it, that's the minimum. So I ask them, the question is, all right, with these new standards now, you're going to put on the river or property joining the river. They claim it would not impact private property. But I ask them, I said, well, what if you have a conservation easement, which is a party, which is a property right, with federal funding? Is that the nexus to take you onto the private property? Yeah. They wouldn't answer me. Then finally, they came back and said, well, probably would be. It only after handling them for a while. So that... This is going to have lots of implications for no degradation or conservation easement up there that's got federal funding on it. It is a property grab. So, so Rebecca, you presented this as information. Or is it, are the directors wishing to take a position or just to be kept informed? If, if you'd like, um, the process is, as explained is. Um, not necessarily moving forward with, with rapid speed, um, we could invite the proponents to um, the January meeting if you're interested um, and to answer questions and concerns about it. We, you know, as I think mentioned in, in the staff memo on this, <clears throat> there, are, there are a couple of areas on Parachute Creek that, that there is some oil and gas activity and, and uh, while well, we've uh, reached out to the industry, we've not actually talked to the lessees up there that is on federal land. We can further those discussions and, and bring back information. Y you could take a position now on, on these issues if you wanted to. Um, it's really up to you or you could direct staff to continue to investigate and look at this. Um, you know. I, I just think it's great that staff has looked into this and has been able to present this information. And I would think it would be valuable to have it in one of our newsletters or updates, because I think the people who really need to be aware of it are the people who live in, in these watersheds so that they understand the process. And if they have concerns, know that the time is now and how they can get involved in raising those concerns. Yeah. Oh, I one, one last quick comment. So the difference between 145, page 145, and 148 on our thing, with, I think this needs to be the minimal amount. And when you draw a full-fledged patch area over a whole mountain range, that's not what I think we were supposed to be doing. We're supposed to protect. I realize that all of that is probably tributary to that stream, but the whole application's the different county applications are not even the same. So I guess that'd be a comment I'd have made too. So thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm not exactly sure what those hatched areas are on the map. They may not be specific to the... Relevant potential conservation area. So that's a... That's a soil conservation. That's a conservation uh, designation that's not related to the stream. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. To the I, that's my understanding. Different we can, thing. We can double yeah. check. On no, that. I almost, I mean, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah, um, I believe so. And, and I'll just add that's not a legal, um, you know, designation. It's it's mostly something uh, created by the Colorado Heritage Program, and they use that to establish that ecological or recreational system. It's like roadless. Yeah, I believe so. <laughs> um, my comment was similar to uh, Director Ritmore's in that, um, you know, part of the, the reason for the presentation is to inform the board, obviously. That's, that's the primary reason. And um, as well as our constituents that might um, uh, be paying attention or reading our board memos as well. I would encourage, um, you know, both at, at the staff level to that, that we do continued outreach with our constituents and, and 
for board members to do uh, some outreach as well with, with their own constituents. My limited experience on water quality issues, this might apply beyond water quality issues as well, though, is that um, you know, we have a generalized objection to outstanding waters designations because of the associated uh, restrictions that come with it. The division doesn't really hear that or the Water Quality Control Commission uh, you know, might not be as receptive to that generalized objection. If there are specific objections about a specific project or some future you know, potential anticipated use, um, that you know, generally you might get a little bit more attention on that, and certainly if that is the case, you know, we can do that address on that. That's what we're doing. Director Hazard, I believe you have your hand up. Revi, are you there? Uh, Hazard, it looks like your microphone's off or not not blocked anymore, but, but now it's blocked, but we could not hear you when you, if you were speaking. Yeah. Well, um, we are, we're not hearing you, so keep working on it. And if we hear your voice, we'll... Uh, well, I, I might suggest, Reedy, if it's possible, if you could type comments into the comment box and we could read them if you have a question or a concern. That's able to be typed. Um, apologize that we can't hear your audio, but. Thank you. And are there any comments from the public? Um, I guess I don't see anyone online from the public, but. Any public comments, but um, I think the suggestion to take this back to our constituents is a good one. Else for Rebecca. Thank you for Thank you. bringing the story. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I would just recommend before we finish the last two items, we just take a quick um, five minute break. So we'll be back at the quarter two. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, we'll get this done before two thirty. All right. Um, all right. The um, general manager's council update, Raquel. If you are still on, do you want to give a quick review? Uh -huh. <laughs> We've lost Raquel. There she is. Okay. All right, Raquel, try speaking and see if we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Great. Raquel, if you want um, a quick summary of your memo or. Uh, uh... Yeah. Um, so we um, started, we had this idea internally of a general manager's council meeting um, and um, we had the first one of those um, the beginning of the year in March, and we had a second one a few weeks ago. Um, and the intent behind it is to um, be um, a place where general managers council of larger irrigation entities in the Gunnison River and the Grand Valley can um, get together and build um, connections. Um, we provide information um, depending on what the interest is at the time or whatever is happening at the time that seems of importance. Um, they exchange experiences and they have the opportunity to co coordinate efforts or regional concerns. Um, this is um, a first, we're calling it more of a pilot of a general manager's council. Um, and so we started these meetings in the Gunnison Grand Valley, but um, if things um, develop well, we could um, consider replicating it in different areas of our district and also with different 
um, entities, smaller size, for, for example, potentially. So um, just wanted to give a brief update on this. Um, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Questions for Red Cow. Great, thank you. No questions, Raquel. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the update. Um, there's a memo, it's a very short memo from uh, Ian Phillips in the uh, packet regarding delayed treasurer's reports. So um, apparently accountants are also understaffed. I just saw a, num a, a news stat that they're the lowest number of undergraduate accounting majors in, in uh, history right now. Uh, no one wants an accountant. I don't know why, Ian, but... Uh, um, but anyway, it seems like a, a challenge. So not where we want to be, but we will work with our treasurer to be back on track. He has been a tremendous asset uh, for years up for the district. So we keep, we keep trying to get him to do it. And if, if we can't, then we'll suggest alternatives. So, um, that's that. Um, I'll hand it back to you. All right, so next up is directors, updates, and concerns. Going on in the in your world. So, Alden, we'll start with you. Well, you look like you got something good. Good. <laughs> Actually, I'm probably going to be fairly short. Oh. Um, the, the, the thing that I noted this year, um, now that the season's kind of winding down, is the hydrograph was higher. Uh, just this past week, the White River gained another 100 CFS. 75 CFS, we don't know where, we're still looking for that, but it came up, I don't know if an irrigation ditch shut down for the season, but whatever. Um, but anyway, um, although the upper White River, meaning from Phoenix Creek on up, did not experience that, that algal bloom that we keep dealing with, the lower White River did. Although the town of Rangeley didn't have to deal with it as badly as what it was, I had several irrigators that even though they installed these very expensive washers, these are big tub washers with screens on them that spin and they reverse high pressure water out of them. So they're burning horsepower. Their drums wouldn't even keep up with them this year. So um, even though the water was cooler, uh, flows were higher, nutrients were still there. So don't tell me that it's due to low flows and temperatures in the culprits within that system. There's something else that's being uh, an instigator within there. There was some traces of it in the upper White River, but not to the nuisance level, um, where as you got lower in the system, it got the nuisance level. And this year, we actually experienced it, it was probably about six to eight weeks um, to where it was extremely heavy um, and people did not utilize the river um, at that time other than for their irrigation purposes, just because you, you couldn't recreate on it. So. That's still going on. Um, maybe it's flushing its way out. I don't know. We hope so. Um, but we didn't have the peak flow like you've seen. 3,600 was a very high sustained average for probably just short of three months. Um, but still, that's above average to where we do get the scouring flows within the White River. So even that wasn't something that we could kind of use the sediment transport to kind of you know sandblast that stuff out of there. So it's still something we're watching. I know where my opinions still lie. There's still direct nutrients being applied to the White River and numerous ranchers and ranches in there, privately held recreation ranchers. I want to make sure um, um, that that, they're, that that's being applied. So um, it's not done. Um, unfortunately, it is sequestering our agricultural production in some properties. So stay tuned. Thank you, Dr. McGinnis. Oh, well, we had the water seminar down there in Grand Junction. It seemed to go pretty well. Not quite as, I didn't see, I didn't think the crowd, I guess the numbers came back. We were a little lower than last year. And, and uh, I thought our lunch speaker didn't quite have the wow factor that we had previously. It was an author that really talked more about writing a book. Several people at our table, about six of us, were long, but but uh, hey, we want to hear what it was like going down the Green River. We ran into this. This is how you do it for writing a book. So we do think next year, at least for the crowds we get in Mason County, focus a little more. <coughs> like we did here before, we had a professor from Arizona or something somewhat controversial, created a little buzz. I don't know, this year seemed kind of flat. 
I'm not sure why. The staff did an excellent job. They did the advertising. I heard it on the radio side, so it wasn't, it wasn't the problem with our staff. Anyway, but it was, we appreciate having it down there. Other than that, it's, it's kind of calm compared to a drought here. So mm -hmm. everything was green and Grand Junction. Okay. Dr. Beckley. We don't have much to report. To. I just would like to say thanks to Andy and Peter for meeting with my uh, county commissioners for a, a more of a public relations meeting, which was great to have you guys come and just make those relationships. I think that's really important to have those relationships in the future. So thank you for doing that. And I look forward to a very wet and snowy winter. <laughs> well, Del Delta County had a great year this year with water. You know, going back to what Director McGinnis was talking about, that's why uh, maybe the attendance was down and and uh, like seminar and junction didn't quite have the kick to it because when you know there's no crisis, everybody's pretty blase about it, and so uh, we'll see what future years bring. But hopefully, I'm like Director Becker said, I'm looking for. And uh, it makes things so much easier for uh, everybody from the water commissioners to the irrigators to livestock handling and everything just makes it easy when there's water to go around. So, uh, we had a good year in Delta County. That's great. Uh, just a couple things that I found interesting. And one is that uh, we had a really bad winter, snow went all the way out to the state line, was really deep. But the sage grouse counts came back higher. Wait, that's kind of good. Uh, deer and elk is devastated, just completely devastated. And then on the subject of, uh, you know, in our county, the power plant shutting down and winds. But there's some, there's a lot of talks going on. There's a lot of, some of it rumor and some of it absolutely definitely not rumor of. Everything from pump storage to some possibility of nuclear at the same plant, uh, some some type of salt project. So, uh, of those three things, all of those are definitely being talked about more than just coffee shop. So, we have some good things to look forward to. I am hoping it's dry now though. Also a good year. Um, we've been really busy with tourists all the way until, you know, like the last week or so. Um, a lot of building in, in Uray County. Um, City of Uray's got a lot of new units going up. Ridgeway's got new units going up. Just a lot of construction. A lot of it's, you know, hopefully affordable housing. Um, a, lot of, a lot of activity. And a local group last week did a, a water, not a state of the river, but I mean, just a water seminar. And you came and spoke about the, the big river issues. And um, it was, I think, very well received. I've gotten comments from people about how much they appreciated it. And so we're, but uh, yeah, we're looking, there's already snow, but the, 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 the Jeep trails are largely closed already, or, sh or people shouldn't be on them. For sure, <laughs> the same pictures that they should. Black Bear before. never got open. <laughs> Black Bear was never officially open this year on the San Miguel side. Um, but a lot of the Jeep trails are already closed, most of them, and you can see real snow, not manufactured, but real snow on a lot of the runs at Telluride. So. So, <laughs> Director Lashard. Uh, basically the same uh, wet, uh, wet spring, uh, really dry fall. Most of the point of where we're kind of, we were kind of concerned <clears throat> about the potential of another, another East Troublesome fire, that sort of dry, that sort of heat and everything, um, which is a huge concern because the next place that would be would be from Granby to Fraser, Winter Park. That'd be the area, or even on the troublesome going towards the muddy and stuff. Uh, that certainly could be a concern for me. 
uh, my son was at a water meeting, did pick up uh, a photograph of Wendy Gap. I will pass that around. It's kind of interesting to see the changes and stuff. I was trying to put some stuff on there, but the uh, part of the picture of Wendy Gap, you know how many in that. So anyway, I'll just send that around and let you kind of look at uh, the money that the River District did put in there was uh, tremendous and, and it did trigger quite a bit of other money that came in to help with this project and stuff. So thank you. So yeah, the water here, I, I sent you guys all pictures of my 200 acres sitting underwater for right. 30 days. So. That was great. Yeah, it was really fun, but yeah, <laughs> tough cabin. Uh, we had some exceptionally high flows back into the 2011 numbers and the rest. Um, the, it spun off into very good for our ephemeral creeks. This is one of the first years since 2000. Yeah, probably eight, nine years that the ephemeral creeks haven't dried up. But that's just like throwing soft water in the field that. But man, we had no rain all summer, hardly. And in Steamboat Springs, 20 miles from me, they'd get rain every day. And it was just really spotty. And I think DK allowed to that as well, statewide, how spotty the rains were. And man, they just went right over the top of mine. We didn't get our first rain until that last snowstorm came in, hardly. Uh, budgets, man, we're still working on budgets too. And Upper Yampa is just like we are here. Um, work the upper Yampas were taken off trying to work with the Forest Service on some type of a forest management plan and or thinning uh, in our uh, upper uh, Yampa and the Bear Creek area drainages and trying to figure out how we can actually do some forest management and not be in the situation of having a fire. Maybe actually, we can do some thinning and forest management. As Director Gray said, we are also preparing for the inevitable, getting closer every year, the uh, coal, coal fired power plants and the assess, accessory mines shutting down. At the same point in time, last year, 20 mile hired, it hired new coal miners and they brought in a temporary camp. And so, and they're hauling that coal. I don't know if that's the same train that went off the tracks in Pueblo, <laughs> but uh, well, that looked ugly. <laughs> Thank you, that's all I have. <laughs> Director Ely. Uh, well, we're also working on the early season base on our mountains, so I'm sure that means we'll be skiing till Memorial Day. Every uh, every certainty, uh, I think, that we can have for a good strong snow year is already showing itself, right? <laughs> um, you know, I remember, it seems like in, uh, in the July meeting, uh, us uh, talking about HH, but I don't remember the River District taking an action on it. Right. Can somebody tell me? Opposed. We oppose it at the budget workshop. Oh, yes. Okay. Action. Good job. Yeah. Appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you very much. Sorry, I wasn't at the meeting. Has Pick and County opposed? Director Haas. Hi, thanks. Um, trying to organize my thoughts. So we are having a lot of turnover at Summit County right now um, in the higher levels. I was talking about this at lunch, but um, we, the commissioner that had been kind of my water point person has left and gone to a state position. So we have a new commissioner though, named Nina Waters. Her name is promising. Um, and she seems to do, she seems very interested in water. So it's good, but it also requires some of my time trying to get her up to speed. And we're going to do a water law 101 here pretty soon. So just trying to, get her ready to engage on these issues. Um, we also lost the county manager. So just all that continuity has been lost, which has been a bit of a challenge in the county. Um, and then kind of related to that, there's um, a project being proposed by our local watershed group that's called Blue River Enhancement Project. It's downstream from Dillon Reservoir and it's um, they applied for money from the river district. So I got involved and started learning. There was all sorts of interesting intrigue and, but also like some CRCA issues that have come up. So I'm trying to work with the county to help them figure that out. I think it's a good project. It's right below Dillon Dam and it's very kind of degraded stretch of river that I think could be, it's such a important part of that community, runs right through Silverthorne, but it, it, needs, some, it needs some support. And I think the river district can help support. I'm trying to help support them kind of figure out how to do it well. 
Um, new construction, Marty, you mentioned that, or Director Whitmore. I was looking at the data from our numbers here, and Summit County is right below behind Eagle County, and $56 million worth of new construction in the last just whatever it's even, of course, that, yeah, 56 million um, valuation. So it's just like we're just seeing this constant growth in these counties, right? It's just right over the divide, and everybody's like, oh, new homes. And if you've driven through Silverthorne lately, you will see the craziness of it. It's just everywhere, just right up against the river, which I know raises other concerns about what happens if it does flood, what happens when we do get these big events. So, anyway, just lots of issues there. And then, you know, the kind of the comment on the good year. I, I have to say, I noticed last night thinking about this board meeting. Like, yes, it was a good year, but it just feels like such a, like, oh, we got through another, good, you know, we got through a year without a fire. And I, that's not a very fun feeling to just be like, every year you're like, oh, okay, we got through a year without a fire. Um, and I'm just worried that that's kind of the trend that we're having to navigate, like you were talking about in Grand County of, that was such a devastating fire at this time of year. Um, and the climate data coming, global climate data is worse right now. Um, and so I just, I want us to keep our kind of eye on the prize of how do we make sure we're preparing the West Slope for what seems to be coming. And, and I know we're doing that, but it just feels like there's never enough time. So I'm glad we're doing what we're doing and hope we can keep focused on that. Uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to pick up where you left off because that was on my list. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the Jefferson <coughs> County folks have been reviewing the GMA um, forest plan proposal that's in final form. And their biggest complaint is that the uh, Forest Service opened up too much ground for um, timber harvest. So in other words, the county wanted less uh, acreage available for harvesting timber and for vegetation removal. <clears throat> and the Forest Service said, no, we've got so much dead um, timber we've got to get. We got to start managing this. And our own county is not happy about that at all. So um, so there, right there is the, the dilemma. Uh, so they're filing an objection to the amount of timber harvest that would be allowed under the GMA proposal. But um, yeah, the other thing that seems to be getting a lot of attention in Gunnison is more water quality related. Um, we're dependent on groundwater for the city. I, I think there were nine wells and two are now uh, not available. And the city has proposed, and, and that's because of PFAS, um, those forever chemicals. And so now we're, we have reduced number of wells and the city wants to build a water treatment plant. <clears throat> Um, and it's in an area where everybody, there's a walking trail. And so the, the, and folks are used to the recreation there and they don't want <laughs> to see um, a lot of treatment plant built there for our drinking water supply. So there is, there's a whole lot of controversy mm -hmm. in Gunnison because we just inject chlorine filter um, these wells. And so there's no redundancy, there's no backup, there's no, you know, we've got to build a treatment plant. And that site was supposed to be where it was going to go and it's caused a huge uproar. <laughs> As you can imagine, then it's not cheap. And then I was uh, also just going to mention that in Montrose on November 9th, I was just looking that up, there's a the Montre the Westfield Water Summit uh, that the county, I think, really gets behind is set for nine to two on November 9th. So, and that's usually a pretty good event. Some great speakers, including yeah. Dr. Columbia. So it should be a good thing. Thank you. And Eagle County, I'll tag on to the fire uh, comments that come up. We have had a number of mostly small fires this summer that have been concerning, uh, caused by lightning strikes, but it has been a dry mm -hmm. summer as well. And one fire that was caused by a car accident that closed down Highway 6 and I-70 for almost a whole day, which was just a disaster um, because everyone was stuck on either side. It was just um, west of, of Walcott that that happened. So 
That was problematic. We have been seeing a lot of success with a new wildland fire group that the county put in some seed money and then lots of other organizations have helped fund. That's a collaboration of all the different fire districts, the Forest Service, BLM, the county, and that's been pretty effective in working at some mitigation of forest health prevention issues. So we're, we're hoping that's helpful. On the uh, waterfront, a couple of things. The county had about, I think about 87 acre feet of water in Eagle Park Reservoir that we have dedicated to Eagle River Water and Sanitation District to use for affordable housing. So it looks like um, the <coughs> project in Dow Junction may be our first test of that to use some of that water that's tied to affordability and housing. Um, through the water district. So it's the whole land planning, water planning, <coughs> trying to connect those pieces. So we're excited about that. And on the negative side of water, the, um, the towns and the water districts are really struggling with these temperature regulations, these GHEs for the wastewater treatment that the, the temperature regulation coming out of the treatment plants is required to be lower than it actually is when it goes in. So. Uh, for them to be able to achieve that standard would be, they think about $100 million for one of the plants. Are unbelievable. So that's, I think, a coming issue that won't be unique to Eagle County. That's it for me. All right. Next up, we have Community Funding Partnership Program update. And if you'll remember, there's a uh, Supplementary memo in your email. If you didn't get it, maybe raise your hand and stuff. Yeah, I uh, originally thought we'd have a quick, short um, update, but um, I was just keeping you on your toes and we had stuff send out an addendum. Um, but I have a short update and then one action item for the board. Um, the short update is that we um, are preparing for a handful of requests coming this January. So um, be prepared for that. But we are happy to announce that we have officially granted 100 grants through CFP over the last three years. Um, I've been pushing Jason to bike a centennial for us. So <laughs> he is not, so if anyone is willing. Um, but really exciting. And I said this at the seminar, we have leveraged over $66 million in the past three years and granted $7.9 million total. So there's definitely been some momentum in the program we're really excited about. Um, and then the last is Starting in January, we will be launching our new grants management software called Flux. And so really hoping that this will help the momentum and the operations of our program seamlessly. Of course, moving to technology might be a little difficult um, for some, but we're really hoping it's going to be a blessing. But um, moving on to your addendum. Again, you received an email with this. So it is customary that when a um, grant that has already already been approved and granted, when they the applicant comes to us and says, hey, we need to change our scope of work, that we um, review it and make sure that it still fits our guidelines essentially for the grant. And so as you were, will remember in April of this year, you approved a $250,000 grant to the city of Steamboat Springs for a smart irrigation central control system. And really what they are looking to do is to centralize and upgrade their irrigation system for about 49 city owned sites. These are parks, open spaces, et cetera. So they are um, really hoping that this will be the catalyst and the first step for the city to showcase, hey, we are taking steps in water conservation and efficiency so that when they start to implement land and water use codes and turf replacement programs, that they are really setting that standard for the rest of their constituents. Um, as you also may remember, this grant was contingent on them receiving a water smart grant. And unfortunately, Right after the board meeting, mm -hmm. they actually found out that they were declined for this grant. 
Now, we all knew this could happen with some of our grants, especially with other accelerator grants, in that it is a risk to apply for a large federal grant. Um, and so we have been working with the city for the past few months to really sit down and say, hey, what, what other alternatives do you have? And the city has decided that they are going to continue with the same deliverables, the same scope of work essentially for this project. But what they're gonna do is phase it out into three phases and extend the timeline. So instead of finishing next year, it'll finish in 2027. This allows for them to apply for further grants, a smaller one through WaterSmart, the round table, um, and other opportunities. And the city is also committed to supporting it at a much higher fiscal threshold. Um, so through a lot of conversations with leadership, we are recommending that the board approve this new scope of work for two <coughs> contingencies. One, that the city agrees that they will complete the entire project, even if the other grants fall through. And they have approved that. Obviously, it'll be dependent on annual appropriations. Mm -hmm. And then the second is that our grant disbursement will be given throughout the entire project. So through the three phases, instead of being concentrated <coughs> in one phase. And the final payment would be held to the end, the completion of the third phase or the final phase. Right. And so our thinking is, I think it's, it's important to honor that they are willing to be creative and adaptive and ensure that this project is going to be completed, especially after hearing the hard news of not receiving a $1.3 million request from the WaterSmart application. Questions? Yeah, Director. So there, instead of getting our requirement in one year, it's stretched over three years, but the amount stays the same? The amount of our grant? Yeah, the 300,000. Yes. The 250,000, yes. So there's not a giant um, change other than the fact that if the timeline is changed and the funders at the table potentially, and that there is some risk. There is a potential they could not finish the project, but um, I think we take that risk with all of our grants. Director Munker. So uh, are we, are there going to be stepping stones or something? So we give them the first money, mm -hmm. split it up into threes, three, three monies. Mm -hmm. Are there going to be performance requirements to qualify for number two? Yes. And, and we, this is customary for... in our grant disbursement program anyways, but they are required to submit a progress report for their disbursements. And we review it and check it with their deliverables that they promised and make sure that they're on track. If they're not, we hold off our cash. And, and it is a reimbursement grant, anyhow. 75% of it, yes. The first 25%, we first allow them to um, receive the first disbursement without reimbursement or without proof of invoices. Right. Um, but down the line, they do have to prove it. The full 100. It's... It's complicated. <laughs> so when, we, when we booked this, we booked in, say, 200000 bucks as a contingent liability so we don't double commit on our funds. Right now, we're, we, we've committed the two fifty. dollars it's, 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 it's moved into our committed funds okay, area. Okay. And, and so the reason we're bringing this back to you really is that when the board approved that grant, it, it's the same scope of work. It's just an, now an extended time of performance. And when you approved the grant, you had a chart in front of you that said they were going to bring in money from the federal government under a water smart grant. They were denied that. We've had a number of discussions with the city of Simbo Springs to say, look, we, we can't approve giving you the $250,000 if you're not going to finish the project. They said, no, no, we'll, we'll finish it. So well, you need to commit. If you're not successful in getting other money, you have to commit to use your own funds. It will be in our amended in our contract with them. And um, I wanted to have Melissa bring this back to the board for approval because it is a different financial arrangement and than what we had presented to you previously on the grant. Was it, I don't understand the thinking of why we wouldn't require receipts from day one. Uh, we have, the board has approved a policy where we can put 25% off front on grants 
so that the uh, grantee can go out and buy materials and and um, okay. So I so I guess it sent its reimbursement, but we still at, we still get the receipts after they after go the forward and buy it. Yes. Okay. So they okay. That was okay, sorry. Yeah. Questions. So your recommendation is to approve the change mm -hmm. based, yes. based on your memo. Yes, with the two contingencies. That I move staff's recommendation. Right. By Monger, second by Beckley. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is approved. Thank you, Melissa. Um, Andy, how would you like to handle? We have two items left for today. Go for it. You want to? I, I, my suggestion that is that we ought to at least. Uh, uh, Handle the external affairs discussion here, um, and, and I think that'll bring us close to five o'clock. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, information and outreach company, Marielle and Lindsay. Okay. Good afternoon, directors. Um, I will also keep this fairly brief for you. Um, and as has been already discussed, most of our memo was talking about the um, recap of our annual water seminar in Grand Junction back in September. And has been noted, it's it was slightly lower attendance than the year before, but I think multiple factors um, were related to that. And Director Rober brought up an excellent point that a lot of folks feeling that um, we had a very good year, water year this year probably contributed to that, um, even though, and as uh, Director Haas mentioned, I think keeping the drumbeat going in years like this, of we still need to think long-term, plan ahead. That was the theme of our seminar. And we had started that drumbeat back in our state of the river season in the spring. And so this was a continuation of that. I think it is a tough message when um, folks are seeing a lot of a, a good wet water year. Um, and uh, so, Continuing to think long-term is going to be a strategy. Lindsay and I are going to be discussing some long-term branding um, for next year's events and how we can do things differently. We always want to keep improving. So we would really appreciate any insight directors have um, and suggestions for moving forward. Um, we did, however, notice uh, a lot of new folks at our seminar this year. Um, I don't know how many people were in the room, but I had asked at one point how many people it was their first water seminar with the district and nearly half the people in the room raised their hands. So I think our outreach um, has been uh, doing well in terms of reaching new audiences, folks who um, haven't been engaged in water before. We also engaged with more students than ever before, which I think is a great um, sign that our, our water world pipeline continues to grow for the next generation of water leaders. Um, and we had a lot of various elected officials and um, press in our audience as well for the seminar. So um, overall, we did a very hard push on every media outlet we could think of and we did our best on that front. So I think it was a success, but um, really thank all of the staff and directors who were able to participate and um, especially uh, staff who uh, threw a lot of different behind the scenes factors in terms of changing uh, speakers and topics at the last minute or last second sometimes. Hopefully it seems smooth from the outside, but we have a very wonderful and nimble staff that supported the event. So just want to give a shout out to, to everyone, especially Lindsay who stepped in as a moderator a few times um, during the seminar when she wasn't expecting to. So um, really a wonderful job. Um, and otherwise, uh, we're, we continue to connect with uh, various members of the press. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we're we're going to look forward, uh, thinking about our next state of the river season. We're already thinking about um, how we can uh, bring in our, our more up-to-date talking points and continue to keep things fresh because we never want to just keep plugging and playing the same same material. So um, again, thank you for uh, hosting us in all of your counties in advance this upcoming spring. And we look forward to that. Um, Lindsay, do you have anything else? Uh, I think we're pressed for time, but I'll be around not, tomorrow. Take your not time. Pressed for time. Just take your time. We're fine. <laughs> Uh, well, I did get to experience another tour, which is noted in the memo, which was really a very eye-opening experience. I took the Colorado River Water Users Association Public Affairs Committee, which is a lot of words in a row there. But basically, uh, they're the ones that are in charge of the outreach and marketing for the CRUA event in Las Vegas, as well as filtering media access um, and allowing credentials for press 
and I'm partnered with Jeff Stela as representation for the state of Colorado, along with public affairs professionals at similar positions throughout the basin. So we had some representatives from the Central Arizona Project again, as well as from MET, Central Utah, and Wyoming, and now also New Mexico. So it was a really interesting mix of conversations as I took them around, and uh, Director Rover was um, generous enough to show us his uh, his little corner of the world when we came that way. But it was sort of about half of what we did with the Central Arizona Project Board. And the questions that they were asking were absolutely on point. I don't mean to brag, but public affairs professionals know almost everything that goes on in the office. And so they were really getting to the heart of the matter. And that was um, really encouraging to see, especially when you get questions from the represent representative from um, the Metropolitan District in California, like, so what you're telling me is that you don't know how much water you can use each year? <laughs> so I, think it was, I think it was a good opportunity to kind of show off our, our best side on the Western Slope and the colors fall over McClure Pass didn't hurt with that either. So <laughs> yeah, Lindsay's participation in the Public Affairs Committee for CRUA uh, dovetails nicely with the fact that I've been on the Program Committee for CRUA um, this year. And so it's been a great way for the River District to be able to engage with interstate representatives at, at different levels um, who participate in CRUA and we get to show them the West Slope, what we deal with here in Colorado, and also have more representation on the CRUA panels this year. So we look forward to anyone who's going to be joining the December conference to, to engage in that way and hopefully make good connections for our people here and our constituents. Lindsay, how many people were on that tour? We had 13 total. So the committee itself has about, I want to say 16 or 18, but they couldn't all make it for the two days. Okay. Well, I, I do want to thank both of you as well as the rest of the staff, but the two of you really put a tremendous amount of time in uh, organizing that seminar and that event. I, um, you know, attendance being, it, it was still a, a high attendance event. Um, I, I think it was a great seminar. I think um, always hard to find uh, speakers who appeal to everybody, um, but it it is it is really uh, a, a lot of work that goes in that, a lot of professionalism. And Marielle already called Lindsay out, but Lindsay stepped in because Zane faked a case of strep throat that day, <laughs> and um, you know, so Lindsay had to jump in and cover him twice. Um, she did a fantastic job for not being prepared and not. And, spoken to any of the speakers on the panels that she handled beforehand so if if i may i mean it's not just the presentations but also the hallway conversations um i know even myself i was able to have lunch with somebody i've never met before but yet we met on the computer personal i know but it was good to be able to talk shop with that individual but also others so yeah, you kind of saw yourself bouncing in and out, but the clientele and the people that were brought in there to participate was broad, multi-state, and it gave me an opportunity to talk with people even in Utah that I've been working with for several years with, with other projects and got to exchange handshakes, which is always appreciated. So um, it means more than, than just a wave on a computer monitor. <laughs> So um, I know that was something else that I enjoyed. So, um, and I thought your speakers there, they're always great. Um, but when they get a unique plug towards the White River, you know, um, one a plush once for Meeker and once for Rangeley, that's kind of a unique acronym that people don't hear, but that's the creativity of the speakers that you brought to where they bring that local knowledge to the table that's not always heard. And that was heard and it was brought in. So. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and, and I was glad to be able to participate. Let's see your Marielle. Well, I, I was just going to add to what Andy said. I, I want to compliment all of you, Peter, Andy, moderated in Utah. I was impressed throughout the day with the staff. And I told you to do that, I hope. Uh, I'm just going to say that again, but it was great, great professional. I, I watched the uh, the YouTube. You guys did great. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't make it. It's a great positioning of the River District. I think it's well known as sort of the one stop shopping for information about the Colorado. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, you're up. 
federal affairs and a report on your vacation. <laughs> well, um, I have no actions for you on either state or federal. It's uh, an interesting time of year for us where I feel like it may be the, the deep uh, inhale before the plunge. Um, <laughs> We've got a handful of, of indications as to what bills are likely to be uh, coming our way in the coming legislative session, but we're just still in the process of reviewing uh, drafts as they come in. Um, thus far, we have seen draft bill on, um, excuse me, on non-essential turf prohibitions in commercial and industrial uh, developments, new commercial and industrial uh, developments that's being brought by some front range uh, municipal water providers. Uh, it was a requested bill uh, by Senator Roberts at the last interim committee hearing. We will see the full slate of interim bills uh, at the end of this month that they're hearing on October 31st. Um, there are a handful of other things that were requested that I'm happy to go over with you. They're all listed in your memo. Total of 16 bills requested. Not all of those are water. Um, as you may remember, this bill was expanded last year to include agricultural interests as well. So there are a number of ag trade and, and veterinary medicine practice bills that were requested. But um, thus far, we know that uh, Rep. McLaughlin the, um, uh, has requested a, a revisitation of the high altitude water storage study bill that was uh, originally championed by the late Hugh McKean before his untimely passing. Um, that topic never got a lot of legs, so I'm interested to see what they propose by way of a study bill there. Um, she's also requesting a produced water bill that would um, address water treatment of non-tributary water for subsequent use and reuse. That's also a perennial topic of discussion. Uh, when I say produced water, I mean water from oil and gas uh, production activities. Um, Senator Simpson has requested a couple of bills, none of uh, neither of which are, are really important to us. Uh, the bills that I'm watching most closely are that uh, prohibition of non tributary, or excuse me, of non essential turf, um, a revisitation of House Bill uh, 1172 from 2020. Uh, that bill was uh, no abandonment for conservation practices that, that enjoyed a robust debate at the Capitol a couple of years ago didn't have the legs to, to gain passage out of the Senate Ag Committee that year. Uh, it seems as though there are some environmental NGOs and others that are interested in having another conversation about that this year. Senator Roberts has requested a bill title on that. So we're likely to see something in that arena, um, although we still don't have uh, legislative language. Um, beyond that, I think, You've read or already discussed today that, that there's a new CWCB director, uh, Lauren Riss, is now at the helm at uh, the Water Conservation Board. She'll be here tomorrow to meet with you. Um, staff has enjoyed a, a long and productive working relationship with Lauren and excited to uh, continue that relationship in her new role. Um, any questions? I, I'm trying to think of what in my memo that uh, you might be interested in discussing more, but beyond that, there's, I, oh, I will note, uh, just last week we heard that the JBC had signaled, and this is related to the last item in my memo, the budget forecasts are projecting a slight dip in, in general fund revenues. Um, so that leaves the JBC in a position of looking for money to, uh, to put into the general fund where, wherever available. Uh, severance tax projections are high right now. Um, the indication from the Joint Budget Committee is that um, severance tax may see a sweep of up to $36 million over the next few years. That, of course, um, impacts the projects bill. It impacts a number of the programs that are funded by the, uh, the perpetual base fund. And, and ultimately, it's um, not the first time we've seen that at the state legislature. It's never a, an exciting thing to see. Uh, the budget committee looking at our water dollars for other uses, but it is uh, kind of the nature of the beast down in that building. So this is, this is the same state government that's going to backfill all the special districts <clears throat> reductions in revenue because of uh, their their backing of HH. Right? That is correct. Um, 
And on that topic, I will note, I've, I've noticed, uh, we talked about it as staff yesterday and I, I dug in on it just to see where things are at on the Prop HH uh, campaign, it looks like fundraising. Um, the opposition has enjoyed a pretty sizable lead in fundraising numbers uh, up until the last returns, which show the, the, su the support groups closing that gap. That's largely thanks to out-of-state dark money. Um, there's a New York-based fund that has dumped a, a good amount of money into the proponent side of the debate. Um, polling, there's not a whole lot of polling out there. It's really a money game at this point. Um, but the opposition still does maintain a slight edge. I will note that uh, Colorado counties and Colorado Municipal League have both come out opposed to it. I think that should help in getting the word out. Um, and they, they, of course, have uh, a, a deep list to draw from. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, uh, I think, noteworthy that both of those entities have come out in strong opposition. Taylor, no. for Director Hoss, sorry. <laughs> um, I just saw the Denver Post is supporting HH, though. Is that accurate? And there's a, quite a few newspapers that are supporting it. And so how does that, why is that? And then <laughs> how does that all play out with the bigger conversation? You no, know, I... I would point to just the general sentiment around property taxes and anything that is portrayed as fixing or addressing that property tax situation in the state as a good thing. Um, obviously, the devil's in the details. And, and as this board reviewed and, and decided, you know, Proposition HH is not in our best interest, nor is it in the best interest of many of the special districts and, and municipal entities on the Western Slope or within our jurisdictional boundaries that rely on um, those taxes. And so I I do point to just, it's been a tough couple of years for, for homeowners with regards to increasing property taxes, especially those in urban areas that may be on fixed budgets. And it's, there's a lot of angst out there around it. Um, but HH doesn't seem to do enough to help with that. The governor says it does, um, but. So those are troubling when you add up all these papers because mm -hmm. people don't probably know who CCI is, but they know who the Denver Post is. Well, um, I would say that CCI's opposition is not strong. It was a pretty split vote. And I just saw some chatter today of various county commissioners who will be speaking out in favor of HH. So. So, man, I'm really concerned again about the sweep of the severance tax monies. It's not the first rodeo we've all been to, and it's never borrowing money. It's just gutting the fund and then taking all of the money. It's another moving monies from the local government going through DOLA, energy impact grants and the rest, and shuffling it back to state obligations that they had. I, this, it's not the first rodeo. They've been... they. When I first was elected commissioner, that I mean, they had they were already way and, and well, no, we can't ever pay it back. You know, it's just gone. And I, I don't know, that just really irks me. I mean, you set up a program and then you don't fund it. So I don't, that's how it is. Okay, sorry, <laughs> my soapbox. <laughs> Anything else on state affairs? All right. So uh, I, I was I heard that the one that you listed from Senator Roberts about the right to hunt fish is going to be withdrawn. Oh, okay. Not that that's a water thing, but it's on your list. It is on my list. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. For state. On federal affairs. Um, about everything is out of date in my memo, other than <laughs> the farm bill is still expired. <laughs> it is, it's a mess. Uh, for the first time in history, we don't have a Speaker of the House. Um, the majority in the House of Representatives this morning uh, held a vote and attempt to get Congressman Jordan from Ohio into the Speaker's position. That vote failed by. Uh, 20 that he needed 17 votes um, from his party. Um, he lost 20. Um, so he ended up with uh, 200 uh, Republicans for 20 opposed or, or
or for another candidate, and then the, the minority party voted in a block, of course. So uh, they expect another vote probably here. It may be occurring right now. Um, they had tried to schedule it for 4 p.m. Uh, mountain time. So it, it may be occurring, but again, fast moving target out there. The chaos does impact us. It impacts mm -hmm. the farm bill, it impacts um, the, the allocation of many of the programs that we've lobbied and fought for over the last few years with IRA dollars, uh, BIL programs, a number of things that, that are not good for water users in the West or the Colorado River Basin as a whole, or at least the impacts of, of the chaos are, are not good for us. Um, I will note that, that some of our priorities are, are despite the, the dysfunction writ large in DC, a couple of our priorities are moving forward. We've seen a couple of important marker bills for the, in the Senate move forward from Senator Bennett. Uh, we've seen Representative Bobert's uh, extension of the Upper Colorado River Endangered Fish Recovery Program past the House Natural Resource Committee. So there's reason to be hopeful that if, if we get a budget, if we get um, you know leadership in the House ironed out, then um, there may be some larger packages that come our way in the, in the next couple of months before the end of the year that would, um, uh, where some of our priorities may make it through. But right now, the, it's uncertain at best. It's just a messy situation, and I wish I had more for you there. Any questions? No. <laughs> what good are you? <laughs> The farm bill, I'm hearing a year out maybe before. So some programs will continue, but are there, are there ones that this district cares a lot about that are going to be put on hold? Really those NRCS mm -hmm. programs that we have worked um, really hard to, to bring those programs and expand the use of those programs or the utilization of those programs within our district. Um, they are not shut down because the farm bill expired. They, they do under the temporary funding package. They, those existing uh, contracts will still be funded. Um, but the expansion of those programs or, or you know, if, if uh, Farmer X has a program in place, he should be okay for the moment. Um, if Farmer Y wants to enroll in a program, those are the, those are the participants that are the Perspective participants are going to be impacted negatively. So. And then, what about government shutdown? Is that that's November, mid November? What's yeah? Okay. Yeah, just before the right. right. November seventeenth, yeah. I think, is the target date yeah. before everybody travels and. Yeah. And and I would say, I originally wrote my memo for you saying it's almost certain that a government shutdown is occurring. It was a couple of days later after. Uh, Council and uh, senior staff reviewed it, so we need an update. And even that is out of date at this point. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a fast moving target. Um, I would say, especially if the uh, congressman from Ohio receives the speakership, a shutdown is potentially more likely mm -hmm. in November than it was just a couple of short weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the farm bill is going to rely on a budget package in order to get the farm bill. Um, extended in any meaningful way. Um, I think we've got to hope for a, a longer term uh, CR continuing resolution that carries at least the, the numbers as they stand today forward. Um, but there's a, a growing, uh, I think, opinion among some in the House of Representatives that many of the IRA dollars uh, that supported in RCS programs, uh, drought mitigation programs, others are. Um, there's a desire to move those dollars over to commodity programs in, in a new farm bill. Um, and so there are going to be fights that have to be mm -hmm. battled um, in order to uh, even see if a, a farm bill moves forward and if it moves forward in any similar shape <clears throat> that it would currently. I can follow up with one more. So with the bucket two, three, two slash three, just this is the um, funding from the Bureau of Reclamation for programs in the Upper Basin. If the government shuts down, how does that RFP go on hold? <coughs> Isn't that something? It's an excellent question. Closing? I don't know that I have a 
a perfect answer for you. I think the answer is yes, the RFP or the administration of those funds pauses. It is already appropriated, so those dollars don't go away. But yes, any work that's being done to um, on the RFP or on um, you know by staff within the, the federal government has to go on pause during the shutdown. Yeah, I mean any of the um, having enough trouble getting. Money. I know. Yeah, so <laughs> it's going to be a lot harder. I mean, yeah. if no one's working, we're not going to see anything. Mm -hmm. moving. And there are deadlines associated with both the IRA and BIL money. <laughs> That they're already going to have trouble pushing up against. So. Thanks. There's a list in my memo uh, for you of, of uh, the rollout of a number of bureau funds that occurred over the last quarter. Uh, those were most <coughs> funded, all of, all funded by the bipartisan infrastructure law. None, none of those related to the, the four billion dollars. Mr. Green. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you all. Um, we have two contract approvals before us, one for Wolford and one for Elkhead. Uh, 15 minutes, 17 minutes long enough for you to get Yeah, that should be all right. All right. So, yeah, with me being between you and half the hour, I will try to make this brief. Um, I did get this note earlier, about half the hour. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, I was the last guy to walk into the room, so they're yeah. saying I got to pick up the tab. <laughs> <laughs> so, it wasn't from you. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> thank you for thank you for announcing that. <laughs> That's <laughs> That's fine. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks in advance. <laughs> yeah. Now we're really excited. So, you know, fourteen and a half. All right, fourteen and a half minutes. So, page one eighty of your PDF. You've got a, a memo from me. At, it outlines a, a contract request and a couple of updates. Uh, the first item on there is a contract request with Kenneth Fleming. So going back a little bit for context, in 2020, we did that comprehensive game safety evaluation. Uh, in that report, they provided a recommendation to perform an updated slope stability and seismic analysis. We had our primary consultant, HDR, perform that work. Um, our subject matter experts, those are our three experts that are on that, that panel. Um, they reviewed that and recommended a more uh, refined seismic analysis. So essentially doing this further analysis will inform whether um, failure due to an earthquake is at a tolerable risk level. So they get through all this um, analysis looking at USGS data and other data, and, um, and they'll, they'll give us some more in, informed information on that. And then, um, you know, I can't read my notes. <laughs> So we've already contracted for an initial phase of this seismic analysis um, under the general manager's authority. Um, and this contract request is to amend that contract for a second phase. And that second phase will provide some further refinement and it will also uh, provide funding to document that analysis. So we'd like to go on to that phase so we can take action on that. Um, let's go ahead and take action on that. So any questions for? Yeah, so how much was it? I didn't see it. That is for an amendment um, not to exceed eighty six thousand two hundred. The amendment is fifty thousand dollars. Thirty six thousand um, two hundred ninety two have already been. Correct. I mean, this comes out of the uh, Wolford O M. This would be the dam deprivation order. O M and R. O M and R. Yeah. Any other questions? I'd move staff recommendation. I'll second. Moved by Monger, second by Alden Brink. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion to pass. Great, thank you. And then, secondly, there's an update on a maintenance issue that I brought up at the July board meeting. So, there's a, a system that raises and lowers these two trash racks at, at the Mount Reservoir at the dam. Um, I would provide an update to the board that those have failed, resulting in one of those trash racks ending up at the bottom of the reservoir. Uh, I went out with, with staff and we located that trash rack determined it was likely in okay condition. So we were able to contract with our um, commercial hard hat diving operation, marine diving services. They came out, retrieved that, um, reinstalled it, and reconnected the both of them. Um, we had asked at the July board meeting to delegate authority to the water supply projects committee in case that ended up being an especially costly uh, project, but it turns out it really wasn't that bad. We were able to do that work under a continuing services agreement. 
Um, so just an update that we're done with that. So there was another update at the, at the July meeting that was made with actuator. So that's the motor that we use um, to raise and lower the main gate. That is one gasket. That work is ongoing. Um, Sam Callahan, our new sire, well, I guess not new sire as of yesterday. Um, <laughs> Sam is working on that with Marine Diving Services and um, is working on a plan. I think we've got a, a plan figured out on how to tackle the project with that. Part of the and then lastly, just a reminder and an update that we will be conducting a comprehensive dam safety evaluation next month. That'll involve a, a number of stakeholders and members mm -hmm. of the subject matter experts I mentioned. Um, I don't think I'll have a final report on that in January, but I should be able to at least give you a flavor of what the outcome of that evaluation was. Should we go on to Elka? Yeah, just, yeah, mm -hmm. just a super quick question on the trash rack is that i assume denver water helps with that now on are they responsible for those kinds of yeah i think it's 40 is it 43.5 45.3 45 and do we have the cons i'm just curious how this all works do we consult with them and say we're doing this and we'll send you the bill or do they weigh yeah them? yeah there, there's a whole process for it i will say every other week we, i meet with their engineering team i keep them appraised of these things Honestly, it's really helpful. They have a, a huge staff of like 1,700 people. So <laughs> I'll mention this to them and they'll say, oh, well, we have somebody that does that all the time. And they'll, so we, 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 do, we have a great relationship there. Great, thank you. <laughs> there is one, one last thing out there. There's a little bit more formal process on budgeting where we keep them appraised of it as well. So we'll pull in their accounting and we, um, we work with them on that. So I, I guess I did have one other question. So you had indicated we're going to put some stainless steel clips on those crash racks. Yes. That's going to happen later in addition to what or we already did that. Already, yeah, already did that. Actually, the same around there. Yeah, well, good. Good job. Good job finding the trash rack fishing. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of fun, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on Wolf? Right. On to LCAD. So on page 182 of your PDF, uh, there's a memo I'll summarize. It's a contract request with DNC Inc. Um, it's a little uh, background. LCAD utilizes a control system. That control system, it's kind of a computer system. It, it allows us to monitor um, and operate the project. Um, the city, city of Craig is the primary day-to-day -day operator of the project. So they uh, ideally would have that system connected to their wastewater <clears throat> treatment center, water and wastewater treatment <clears throat> center in Craig. Um, currently that control system is no longer fully functional um, and it's also outdated. The manufacturer isn't even gonna service those components in another two years. So the, the purpose of this contract is to have us have <clears throat> our contractor um, design and implement a new system that will restore and improve the function of that control system. Uh, one big benefit of this is it will allow us to remotely operate one of the gates. <clears throat> so currently, if you ever need a, a slight change in, in outflow, you have to send somebody out there from the city of Craig to drive out. It's you know it's a 45 minute round trip. It's terribly inefficient. So this will allow us to, to tweak those flows remotely. Questions for Hunter? <clears throat> motion? I'll make the motion to approve that. It's like uh, moved by Ben and Brink, uh, second by Tom Gray. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Look at that. Thank you. We got an app for our phone. We do it right from our phone. So it's really slow. That is is the Lake have Verizon out there or what? Uh, yeah, we can get some, some hard light. No, it's we can do cellular. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so six o'clock at Glenwood Canyon Broom Pub and 8.30 in the morning for our budget hearing. It's at Hotel Denver. Oh, it's over. It's down. Oh. We're in the far back on the first floor. Um, no, first floor. First floor, and we're not going down to the cellar. We're just far back. We wanted to turn.